Advisor I see and other folks. And we have Miss Allie there too. She was not over. She is a terrific. Good evening, student. Ambassador Rhodes. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. You too. It's been a while. It has been a little while. <laughs> so, I've, I've become a blonde since the last time I saw you. You have. <laughs> I, well, you're not on my screen. I have to put everybody on my screen so I can see everybody. <laughs> Almost, I'll just to start up shortly. Um, let me make sure we get everybody in and the tech's working okay. I see there, Renata Valerie, you've just uh, come in. A, a quick hello to you, Renata. And uh, let me get to say everybody, hello to everybody. Hello. For coming in. Dr. Okay. We have that mediating giant, Renata Valerie. We do. We also have Dr. and uh, Pastor Guy Witherspoon here, I see, who is. Uh, as a ministry, a church in uh, not only in Carson but also in the Philippines and other places, and a leader, so a leader of men. Down. Hello, everyone. And Reverend, good to see you. We may have a few more folks coming in, and uh, just about to start up here. So we may have some people come in and then they have to leave or they come, you know, they come in a bit later as well. So we've got some notices from folks that they're very interested in supporting us. But they have to come in and go out for other meetings and so forth. But we'll have people coming uh, as we go. Okay, and I see Robert, you're there from Alaska. Are you, are you currently in Hooper Bay, Alaska, Robert? Yes, I'm in Hooper Bay, Alaska. Okay, cool. You also have a place, as I understand it, also in uh, Washington State, in uh, the Olympics area. It's really beautiful there. Yes. Summer's in Port Angeles, Washington, and winter's in Hooper Bay, Alaska. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... Uh, and we see Anissa there supporting us. Anissa, I'm going to go ahead um, and start off our proceedings. Is that uh, about right? Yes, you're all set. Okay, thanks very much. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you, by the way, for supporting our event and all the events. You're very welcome. Yeah. Uh, first of all, before we start, I really want to take, uh, and this is a personal thing, I, I really want to, want to say to Nancy Perry, who's been a real friend of the program and supporter of, uh, of all of us, of the professors in the program, of the students, of alumni, um, bringing community folks to, to, together with us as well. Uh, Nancy Perry, I just want to say to you, uh, I'm so grateful for all the work that you've done in the program and uh, how you supported the NCRP program. And you continue to support it. You're still a friend of the program, even though now you're moving on to communications at the university and, and helping them. Um, you still continue to help out in the background and remain a friend of the program. Um, I'm so grateful for you, to you for that. And I just want to take a moment here to acknowledge your work uh, in front of everybody here. And I want to give you kind of a round of applause if you can do it digitally or whatever. But uh, just to let you know, I am very grateful for your support. And uh, the program is as well. And we're doing well because of it. Thank you, Brian. You bet. Now, I want to also say that uh, we are introducing uh, as an, our new support coordinator, uh, Ariana Atienza. And I think, Ariana, you like it said Ariana, yeah, right? Not Ariana or Ariana, but Ariana, like that. I think that's how you prefer. Correct. Okay, so Ariana uh, is going to now work as our support coordinator. She's very personable, brings a lot of expertise from Compton College and other places, uh, and has been very good and, and really supportive of the program. Uh, since you arrived. And so, and you know, you've just taken on a lot very quickly. And I'm very appreciative, and we all are, for your willingness to do that. And, um, and you're flexible, being able to be flexible with the, all of the things that we're doing. And the program has many moving parts, as you know. And so I'm hoping that uh, as we go along, that that will become a, a lot of fun as we continue forward. Is this already uh, happening? And that will, that will go forward on that basis. And, and as I say, Nancy has been helping out as well. And um, 
it's been a quite a um, a quick ride for you, I know, to, to come on with all this going on. So but I want to also really acknowledge you here for your work. You've done a lot of things and been really a good sport about things in the last few days. You're just getting people registered and start over the semester. So thank you, Ariana, and welcome. Thank you, Brian. I also want to just talk briefly now about the program itself that we are doing very well, actually. So the state of the program, we're actually, uh, now we're over enrolled. Our courses actually um, in the MA have bounced up in enrollment due to all the hard work of Nancy and Ariana and our faculty, um, all the faculty involved in helping out in, with the program and getting the word out about the program. It's actually doing very well as a result. And um, now that we, but we have to be careful too because we have, we want to make sure our, our classes are kept at a quality level. So we don't want them to get too big at the same time. I should say that our classes are very interactive. Unlike standard programs and master's programs and professional programs and the universities that simply are theory, they teach theory and that's fine. They, you know, that's what they do, but we don't do that. We actually are interactive. We're, we're very practic practical, practice-based, we, we really focus on skills and having students learn skills and practices, professional skills and practices, so that they can go to jobs and to uh, professional settings to do the work uh, that they need to do. So I want you to see your professors in the program as your mentors and guides, and they, they take that role on seriously. All our teachers are practitioners. They're practitioners first, and then they teach what they know. So if somebody's teaching your course, you know that they're, they're a practitioner in that area. And so they will have a network, a professional network that you can connect to. And you should ask the, your professors to engage that network and to, you know, to who should they talk to about various areas of practice? Because that, that, that's really something you do as a professional skill uh, is networking. And we wanna really encourage that in the program. And your professors have those networks. The same with the practice skills. We really want you to, to, to connect with your professors, more like mentors than really standard teachers because they're actually bringing the, net, the skills to your classroom and to you personally. So you want to build that rapport with each of the professors you're working with. And, and, and our professors are great. They really, that is their focus. It's really all about the practice skills and having you develop those skill sets. So uh, what I wanted to do up front here is to just have our professors go around the, the room here if we could and I'd ask our professors to say what they teach and then projects they're working on, the actual practice they do or the projects they're working on currently. And just take a moment or two to do that. So we'll be quick and go around the room doing that. But I want you to get a sense of who you have here because you have some terrific professors, um, all practitioners, as I say, and all leading in their areas that they're working in. So perhaps we can start with Ambassador Rhodes. If Ambassador, you're there, um, if you would like to step up and uh, say a few words. Uh, my name is Steve Rhodes. Uh, I've been teaching at Dominguez now four years. I teach international conflicts, negotiation, mediation, conflict resolution, and peace building. <clears throat> and it's been a pleasure working with the students. And I have a, a couple on this call right now who were just wonderful. And welcome, Ariana. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and so your areas are, for example, international. You do policy-related uh, work. You also do international work and, and, and leadership. Also, you're doing some terrific work in leadership currently and connecting uh, a number of the people in our society, actually, leading prominent practitioners to the classroom, bringing those people into the classroom. We're very grateful for that, Ambassador. Thank you. Professor okay. Valerie. Professor Valerie, would you step up for a moment just to introduce yourself so folks can see? Thank you. Certainly. Hello, everybody. My name is Renata Valerie, and I teach mediation. I teach communication and conflict and community and conflict, which is my area of expertise. Some of the work that I'm, I'm doing right now is I do a lot of conflict, conflict coaching. Um, I'm working with some of our great NCRP students on the Peace and Education Initiative. We'll talk about that, I think, a little bit later. Yes. And um, I also am doing some work with the state of Indiana in redesigning their um, prevention, their substance abuse prevention system. So thank you. Glad that you're all here. 
Thank you, Renata. And we will talk a little bit later about the projects that you're working on in terms of the grants and so forth to let students know about that. Thank you. Uh, moving along, Professor Guy Witherspoon is actually Pastor Guy Witherspoon and uh, has been teaching. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself, Guy. Thanks. Okay, I'm Pastor Guy Witherspoon. I uh, think I've been teaching in the program approximately 26 years off and on. Uh, I was a student in the program way back, uh, but teach. Um, Started with managing race and ethnic conflict, computer applications in the behavioral sciences, communication and conflict, and then recently developed a course on pastoral mediation and interface dialogue. That's currently what I'm working on is building that course, you know, to talk about how faith leaders assist in resolving disputes or man helping people manage their disputes. And you work with churches locally, and you've also worked in the Philippines, and currently work with the, Phil with the Philippines. Right. Well. I have ministries, Philippines, India, and Pakistan. Wow. So, you know, uh, so anybody out there, students, if Pastor uh, Witherspoon is really the, a great resource for the pastoral mediation, and that is a growing practice. So I know, Susan, you've been involved recently in writing on that area and working in that area. So... Let's move along here. So we have uh, Dr. Kreiser, Dr. Pamela Kreiser. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, a whole bunch of you I know from class. So welcome back to those of you who we haven't seen each other for a while. Uh, my main responsibilities at Dominguez Hills are in two areas. One is quantitative methodology and the other is teaching mediation. And so I do both of those um, here and there, depending on the scheduling and uh, see so many of you because that course is 507, which is the methodology course. And so uh, that's how I get a lot, get to know a lot of students. So anyway, um, what am I doing lately? Oh boy, what am I not doing? I think the most interesting thing to talk about in this meeting would be that I serve as on the advisory board for Kids Managing Conflict, and you may know that organization. Mm -hmm. And we have a really exciting project that we're doing in, a, in response to COVID which is to try to help these high schools and junior highs, but mostly high schools at the moment, um, use a brand new app that we have adapted to, for their peer mediation program. So the peer mediators in that school or in the schools that we support are able to, through the app, connect with people electronically because we're in such a distance environment, right? So you may know, um, if you've been in the divorce mediation area, you may know of the app that it comes from, which is called Co-Parenter. And many of you know that it's probably one of the most famous apps that is used very widely throughout the United States. Uh, they've resolved around 50,000 conflicts so far through that app. And so we've taken that app and developed what we call Peers. That's its working title. And we're rolling it out in about 10 high schools right now and hope to make it wider after that. And it's a bumpy process because it's a brand new app, but we're working on that. And as you might guess, we have some complications because it's minors too. So we have many things that we're working through, but um, the goal is to try to give them a way to connect with one another that the app can facilitate. And Pamela, you've also done students, uh, any students interested, Pamela actually does work in dispute systems design. It's at the DSD, that area, and connects students with that area. And I really want to encourage that because I think it's a, uh, really the growth area it's one of the big growth areas in our field so, and program evaluation of course right checking out where the programs work how they work if they what could be improved so these are all right. skills and, that you bring and for those of you who have had the 507 class you can guess that the big question right now in the app is what data to collect and and how to collect it in a meaningful way that will translate into more funding for peacemaking programs peace building programs so that's that's our task so, thank you. Anyway. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah, I appreciate it very nice much. You. And your support of the ongoing support of the program. And Dr. Erb, Professor Erb. Hi, everyone. I have taught every course in our program and designed several of them. So, uh, and my practice uh, the last 30 years has been very rich domestic and international. So, please approach me about any of your interests. Uh, where I am right now, the State Department just let me know that I've been picked as one of 35 of their international alumni uh, for a gathering on environmental diplomacy to help this country with the greening of uh, all that we do. 
thank God. And the other thing that I have been doing in the last year is spearheading some GE courses, some really big courses to introduce our program to the campus and hopefully recruit new students. I am teaching the GE War and the Human Experience right now, what timing with the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and 20 years of war. I have students like I've never seen uh, doing their own research studying because as many of them say, they were not born or they were just born at the time that we entered Afghanistan. So I know several of you and anyone who has not met me, feel free to reach out and connect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irvin. Congratulations on that uh, recent um, appointment. That's great. Terrific for the program and terrific for you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Robert Whipple from Alaska, Hoover Bay, Alaska. Robert. Okay. Um, I, I'm Robert Whipple. I started teaching in the program in 1995. And my first course that I taught was I co-taught managing race and ethnic relations with uh, Pastor Guy Witherspoon. Um, since then, I've uh, taught several courses, which were the communication and conflict online dispute resolution. And um, I'm currently teaching the capstone course. As far as my professional involvement right now, I'm on the city council of Hooper Bay, just getting out, out of interviewing more police officers or uh, village police okay. officers today. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm at my work, I'm a school psychologist and special education teacher. So I am running all of the individual education meetings and the psychoeducational behavior plans. And um, I, in the school, we have um, facilitative you know, dialogue or circles constantly going um, as an alternative to the traditional school discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, welcome to the program, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ripple. Robert, you also, you do a number of things in Alaska. It's terrific in, that, in the village there. It's a small village, isn't it? It's on the north coast, I think, of, of Alaska. And it's often cold a lot of the year and, you know, interesting. Yeah, we're actually the largest off the road village in America. We have about 1500 here and we, the only way to get here is by plane or by barge. Um, so that's an invitation to students then to think about uh, going to and connecting with Alaska. It's a wonderful place. And Robert, you're there. Also, you have the connection to Washington state as well, which is terrific. And also you're really uh, done a great job teaching our capstone course uh, for a good number of years. And I just want to, uh, pay uh, special regard here and, and acknowledgement for the great work you've done with the capstone course. Thank you very much. And it's been a terrific support to our students and we'll continue. Okay. To and we support. just had five students finish this week. So oh, terrific. Very good. we're moving Thank forward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Della Chopa, Dr. Cara Della Chopa. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Cara Della Chopa. This is my 19th year at CSUDH. I'm a sociology professor and I teach sometimes in NCRP. I've taught public policy conflict and recently have gotten into the area of coaching. I have, I'm on my third year of a National Science Foundation AGEP grant um, that deals with um, Gallup Strengths Coaching um, with um, untenured uh, minoritized STEM faculty to improve their resilience and job satisfaction in the CSU. Um, on our third year, we've gone from four campuses to all 23, and I'm going to be doing this for the next few years. And so this is becoming an area of expertise, and I'm hoping to eventually teach this in the NCRP program and coaching. Thank you, Dr. Villachopa. So, Kara, you're actually you're out there actually doing coaching right now, and so this is a growing area of dispute resolution as a practice. People in, involved in, in cases and litigation and elsewhere are now in, employing coaches to help them with that litigation. Even we just learned recently from Brazil, uh, from our affiliate program at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, 
uh, Jay Damiani, who just let us know that in fact, coaching is now they're doing an international commercial arbitration, they're bringing in coaches. So it's amazing how these practices develop. Thank you very much. And I'm moving now to uh, Dr. Renee Castro. Dr. Kene, uh, Renee Castro, uh, uh, Renee, terrific instructor, been a big support and to give you the floor here. Hi, great. Welcome everybody. Uh, again, my name is Renee Castro and I currently serve as a faculty member at CSU Dominguez Hills and teach in the NCRP program. Uh, some of the courses I teach are labor and workplace conflict, negotiation and collective bargaining, arbitration, and uh, a couple of others. Uh, prior to joining the campus, I served as the assistant vice chancellor for employee and labor relations at the California State University Office of the Chancellor. In this role, I oversaw gr the grievance and arbitration process for the entire system with over 40,000 employees and, and covering 13 collective bargaining agreements. I have about 30 years of experience in both public and private sector labor relations, including 18 years working on the, on the union side in a variety of, le of leadership positions. I've also served um, over a decade as a senior university administrator at both the campus and system-wide level. And uh, I earned a D uh, my EDD in educational leadership with a focus on community college and higher education. And I'm also a faculty member in the uh, College of Education, the Graduate Education Department. And so I wanna welcome all of you to, to the program. Some of you have taught in my classes and I've always enjoyed having you and uh, look forward to meeting the rest of you. Thank you, Dr. Castro. And I really have just a personal shout out and appreciation of your support um, of the program. It's been terrific, so thank you as well. Um, I wanna say that we have a number of professors who are not here tonight actually that are practitioners. They're, they teach periodically in the program and sometimes they can't be here because they're on assignment, they're doing something else. But do reach out to those professors. We will make them available. We, we always invite people, include them in, and we want you know, folks to be connected to the program. And so um, you know, I've, there are a number of names to mention, but basically maybe to say here that we have a number of people that work with our program. We have the, you know, the ombudsman from Tennessee, and we have various, uh, Brian Pokemhorn in, in Maryland runs the Bosnerman Center of Dispute Resolution, does a lot of international stuff. Um, they are, others as well um that they are very uh, supportive of the program they are continuing to offer that support and will teach periodically and so we'll reach out and always have the connection to those other practitioners friends of the program i call them um but there are a few here tonight actually that have, i want to just give a, a quick shout out to and i i see that uh, dr thomas norman who actually teaches in business but is very supportive in, of arbitration mediation dispute resolution practices uh, Thomas, would you like just to say a word or two? Or, uh, sure. Thank, thank you for the invitation. You know, the over, overlap class you might look at that I'm teaching right now and teach to uh, normally two times a year, sometimes in summer as well, is labor and industrial relations. And we do have a unit on uh, alternate dispute resolution. We, we touch on arbitration, uh, mediation, you know, fact-finding type things. So that's the, the relation. And I am in our business uh, in public uh, policy school. So thank you for the invite. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Um, and we also have Vince, uh, sorry, uh, Zach Ritter, who's our Associate Dean of Students. Zach Ritter, I know you're, uh, do I see you there? I'm just looking. You want to say a hey, few words? Hey, I'm here, everybody. Zach, okay. Um, hi, um, I'm in the car, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> I'm Zach Ritter. I'm the uh, Interim Associate Dean of Students, and I also teach in the HEAL program, uh, graduate education, um, but I also do some work uh, been doing some guest speaking with um, with the peace negotiation department. So, and I look forward to doing more in the future. Great, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Zach. And you're certainly a friend of the program, and we're looking to work with as well in the program. Thank you. Um, that's great. So uh, now, if I missed anybody or anybody wants to chime in, uh, you're welcome to just take a moment here because it's I can't all see everybody on the screen, so. Uh, if you have enough, if you want to chime in, you're welcome to. Uh, I know we have a number of friends of the program, not only teaching, but also in the community and in organizations that support the program. And, so John, uh, John Swarbrick uh, sends his regards. It's about 2.30 2 in the morning in Edinburgh, where he's currently living. Oh, wow. so he's not available that's, for the call. Oh, well, that's great. But, uh, but John actually is, is a, uh, an attorney and uh, highly experienced in all things labor relations and, and employment law and a great resource if, if you've got interest there. Thank you, Renee. And, and so John is terrific and doing lots of good work in the 
in the arbitration area, like you say, in labor relations, which is just terrific for the program. And he lives currently in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, anybody else want to chime in or say anything briefly? We um, want to make sure that we have not missed anybody. And if we if we don't, you can also put it in the chat as well. And uh, if you're a community member, also just say hello in the chat. Um, if if not, if we're, we're ready, we'd, I'd like to um, go on now to talk uh, to uh, go over to our student panel. Um, so um, we have. Um, so if you, the next little while we talk, we'll have a student, some of the students in the program, alumni, will speak about their experiences, their job experiences, and life generally, and to give us, you know, an update on what they're working on. And uh, this is going to be led by Julie Ali, our uh, alumni uh, panel. And Julie's doing terrific work herself. She's um, recently worked on this grant with Dr. Um, Valerie in the JAMS and the NAFKIN grant. We'll say a little word, a few words about that later. But Julie, you're doing terrific work in the transformative dialogue area. You've been actually doing these dialogues on our campus with Dr. Valerie and others and reaching out to the community. And so terrific work. I just want to acknowledge that work and then turn it over to you here to introduce our alumni panel, student panel. Thank you, Dr. Jarrett. I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm a recent graduate of the program. Um, it was back in May, I finished the, the NCRP graduate program. And now I'm working as the Peace and Education Director. Um, hopefully many of the new students have heard about um, the work. It's a new program that we are using to um, kind of hone our skills in community dialogue and um, dispute resolution practices that we've learned in the program, um, but more of an, in, a, in a community realm, really. Um, Dr. Jarrett talked a little bit about the grant. Um, that was a new experience for me and, and peace and education has really allowed me to, I don't know, look at new experiences I never thought I would do and grant writing was one of them. Um, and fortunately for us, it was um, a good process and we were actually awarded the NAFCOM grant um, about a month ago, which will um, fund our, our initiative at the university for um, peace and education. Um, and part of that program will be looking at some inequities in healthcare, um, specifically in Compton, the Compton area. Um, uh, Professor Valerie, in, in reviewing a lot of data, realized that their life expectancy is way lower than other places in, in, the, in the LA area. So we'll be looking at that um, kind of also through a community lens um, of trying to figure out what the problem is, but through a community input you know, going to the community and, and trying to find out, you know, where we can make a difference in addressing the inequities um, to healthcare in the Compton area. Um, some of the skills that um, came from NCRP, I, I didn't really realize how, how transformative they would be um, for me until after I finished the program. Um, <laughs> the, the biggest one is probably Dr. Kreiser's class 507. I was so scared of that class when I began. <laughs> When I began the NCRP program, I am not mathematically oriented at all. And now um, anybody working with me in peace and education will probably tell you that all day I'm like, oh, we can measure that. Oh, we have to figure out how to measure this. We have to figure out how we can evaluate this and that. And, and it's a class that I never expected to. Um, I, I was hoping to get through it when I initially started, not um, wasn't sure how much I would use it. And it's, it's something we're using it very frequently. Um, some other projects that we're working on in peace and education, we are, um, well, it really kind of initially started from a dialogue with policing that Professor Valerie um, invited many of us to do. Um, and that was a dialogue centered around policing issues that were in the Antelope Valley. From then we've, um, we've had dialogues about vaccination hesitation and um, the education issues that we've had, you know, getting through COVID and everything. Um, some future projects that we have, uh, we're working with um, the wonderful Dr. Stephanie Myers, who will speak later this evening um, to host a youth summit and, and really hear from our youth. Um, we, we found they have a lot to say and, and um, give a lot of hope for the future, which is great for all of us. Um, so we'll be helping host that along with a concert so they can share their music and, and expression, really. Um, we're also working on a few different training programs. Uh, some with uh, CSULA is one that we've been talking about um, and programs within, to, you know, for new volunteers, as well as um, programs with the Southern Bureau of Ministerial Alliance. And um, we also are working on a dialogue that's in, in process of 
you know, design for addressing the issues of Afghanistan and our veterans that are really experiencing a lot of just, can, I don't know when to say confusion, but just difficulty with everything that's happened over there. So um, we really are doing a lot of different work and, and we're also doing some training with, um, gonna be help assisting um, Avis really Thomas with some training or not training, but um, dialogues for the LA Fire Department in the near future. So we have a lot of different things, a lot of different opportunities for students to um, practice what they're learning and see how they can make a difference. Because I think that's where I kind of got hooked is, is seeing that we can make a difference. Um, and every dialogue we've had has turned into other projects, has turned into wonderful feedback. And, and I think we've all, as volunteers, gotten a lot from it. And um, just also I've left out, we have a, um, an interesting project that we'll also be offering. Um, um, Andrea Bellini, who's one of our students, um, is also going to be working on offering um, artistic um, scribing, which is something that I didn't even know about until she came into our program. And, and, you know, many of us, we scribe our notes and everything as we're working through dialogue, but she can do it artistically. Um, so that's something else that will be shared. Um, as you know, she'd like to teach other people how to do it as well. So there's, there's a lot more I can say, but anybody that's interested in joining um, Peace and Education, just reach out to me or Professor Valerie. We'd love to have more of the wonderful students that are part of this program. There's a lot of us who graduated the program who just didn't want to leave. <laughs> and this has kind of given us an avenue to stay, but also like share what we've learned and learn from what we're doing um, in, in the project. So it's been a great experience. And to move on with that, I also want to share some of the experiences of some of the other students that are in the program or have graduated. And um, the first person that I'd like to talk to is Matthew Polk. Are you with us, Matthew? You're Hi, muted. Go ahead. You. Hi. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Um, I'm doing great. Can you just tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what you're doing post-graduation? And you, you graduated already, correct? I have not graduated. I'm oh, actually I'm sorry. in my second second year. I'm uh, sorry. Just my second year of the of the program. Okay. Uh, and uh, I uh, as a former musician and music educator, I eventually became um, a teacher. And uh, as you know, being a teacher, I started getting involved uh, in my local union and the bargaining for the common good movement, trying to make better schools and eliminating inequities. And I currently work for a labor union in Vermont, uh, Vermont NEA, so labor union representing educators, uh, where I get to apply many of the skills I've learned here. And you know, I've been involved in education for quite a while. I have a master's degree in education and doctorate degree in education, but, and people ask me all the time, like, why are you going back to school? And it's because I get to study uh, really cool stuff that I can apply uh, to the work that I do. It is really interesting how it doesn't, there, there are so many of us in different fields and it really applies everywhere I've seen. I mean, we have educators, we have, um, we have lawyers, we have so many people in diverse backgrounds. So it sounds like even music fits into that, that world. Um, what's something that you absolutely love so far being part of NCRP? Well, I agree with you. One of the things that I've, um, I've enjoyed about this uh, program is the opportunity to cross paths with you know, other individuals from a pretty broad, uh, professional and personal background. Um, but, you know, I've also appreciated opportunities I've had to tailor uh, my studies to my distinct interests in my professional field. Um, for example, you know, as I said, I do a lot of work in labor um, and there's some terrific experts in the field. You, you know, we just met Dr. Castro and uh, John Swarbrick has done a lot of work. I work closely with them. Um, but I, um, I think I really appreciate um, to, you know, a practical thing and, and, and a little more ambiguous, but a real thing is that I'm originally from the West Coast, but I'm currently, as I said, living in Vermont. So the format of classes has been super convenient for me, less so on nights like this. Like sometimes, I, you know, it's, uh, it's 930 back here it's around dinner time for you guys. But uh, and, in general, I've really appreciated the opportunity to um, make classes work with my schedule. So that's a practical thing. Um, but the more ambiguous thing is that it's allowed me to work with 
uh, practitioners in related fields and to cross paths with other students and other professors uh, in, in fields that are not uh, the type of uh, people that I'd run into on a regular basis. And so it's, it's given me uh, a lot of cool chances to kind of cross pollinate ideas and think about things in a different way than I might otherwise. It's really interesting. That's really been my experience too. And I think a lot of us just are surprised how much we're alike more than we're all different, um, different political views, whatever. It, it's, we still find connections. Um, what about um, skills that you learned in the program? Have you found any specific skills that have been helpful for your work or work that you hope to do in the future? Yeah, so I'm an organizer and an advocate for a labor union. I, I represent all types of educators from teachers to you know, bus drivers and school custodians. But a lot of my work consists of you know, traditional advocacy in the context of a labor union like negotiation and grievance processing. And I think there's just been really clear and immediate uh, skills um, that have helped me improve in that regard. Um, but also I do a lot of training uh, for, for educators. And um, one of the things that I've uh, really appreciated about is, uh, you know, Dr. Jarrett mentioned that it's not just theoretical work that we do here, it's very practical work. And I've, in every single class I've taken, I've been able to pick up new strategies and tactics for training people that I work with. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of organizing uh, educators to implement changes in their workplace and in their communities. And so I've had opportunities to learn from professionals uh, who are teaching classes, but also I'm working with a lot, you know, side by side as a, as a student colleague with a lot of other professionals who are doing the same thing in their workplace. So I just feel like there's, um, it's just surrounded with this wealth of information that's coming through formally, uh, you know, through the, the material that's in the syllabus, but also less formally in just the natural course of conversations that occur um, as part of being enrolled in a class with a lot of different professionals. Thank you so much, Matthew, for, um, for sharing your experience and, and great to have you in the program right now and learning all the great work that we've all experienced. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, you know, one of the other things that I, um, you know, I've been in school for, for a while, a good chunk of my life, and this is probably the first program, um, even though I'm, in, you know, I have a job and professional setting, but that I've really felt supported and see evidence of um, like lots of opportunities to get people connected to what they want to do. Um, so, for example, uh, as a researcher, uh, Dr. Jarrett has invited me a while back to help out with the, uh, the journal that the program puts together, the Applied Dispute Resolution Journal. Um, and Kara has taken the lead on that. And so because there's been this, um, uh, this kind of support, you know, I've also seen lots of opportunities to get people connected with future employment and internships. And, um, you know, some of the work we do is, uh, is somewhat theoretical, um, but there's a lot of uh, real, you know, jobs out there and, and opportunities for people to get connected with employment. And I feel like the program's just done a really excellent job of helping people uh, to see what other opportunities exist out there. I agree. I've, I've also seen there's been a lot of changes in the last year of um, just doing more the actual work and, and less reading about it and more experience has been good for me too. Um, well, thank you for your time, Matthew. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, next up is Nicole Picotta. Can you hear Nicole? We have her on here. Sometimes there's a. You know, I am here. I am here. Um, so yeah, uh, yes, I am here. Thank you, Julie. So okay, time. I can I could move on to the next person. And come back if you need to. Nope. I'm, this is okay. a good time. I'm I'm out of work. Um, so okay. how are you? I'm. I don't wonderful. know if you can see me. I see everybody and nobody at the same time. I think I see like five of you at once. So, right. um, Nicole is a, a, a recent graduate, I believe, also. And uh, no, I, Julie, I also, um, my, I've, I've actually completed everything. I just have to get that capstone completed, but hopefully I'll be pushing that out 
um, in the, at the end of this year, but I definitely have a good excuse if there was ever any, any <laughs> excuse. I was just hired with the state of California and the um, Apprenticeship and Innovation um, Workforce Innovation Unit. And I'm really excited about that. In addition to that, um, I today was my last day at OLLI, OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute. So um, yeah, <laughs> so something really great to celebrate. So yes. Professor Whipple, you will be getting my information. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And I, I should have mentioned earlier that Nicole was really our visionary for um, peace and education. Um, you know, a lot of us students had thought that we needed a, a, a program, a way to, to practice what we were learning and everything. But Nicole is the one who really brought it into reality and started the project um, and, that, you know, designed the first dialogue and like I said, she was really our visionary. So I want to share that and um, and just how appreciative we are and and everything for Nicole. So um, Nicole, would you like to share your experience in the NCRP? NCR sure. So far? Julie, thank you. I am so humble. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, I'm calling you for my phone, as I said, as I end my um, my that short professional career at Ali OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute. But I actually came into the program in 2008. Life took me out and I had to come back in. Um, Pastor Witherspoon, he probably, rem he, I know he remembers me from way back when. So um, thank you. He's He's been there for me. I really appreciate it. What I get most out of the program is the connection with the professors. Um, Ambassador Rhodes, um, Professor Dr. Kreiser, Kara, I know that you all are in there, Pastor Witherspoon, Whipple, all of you. What I think that is so great for me from the beginning of as I um, relaunched my career until now, um, these individuals have been there for mentorships. And I really appreciate it. Um, Professor Kreiser you, Kreiser, you might remember, Dr. Kreiser, you might remember in your class, as Julie was um, sharing, that was a scary class. And I was actually using the program information from my class, mm -hmm. from, from the program that I'm working on now. And just I remember, to but we don't want to focus on the scariness. We want to focus on the successful exit. Well, well, this is what I want to share with the class that going through that, it was amazing to, to begin to see how everything came together. And using that information now, I use that information now, I have to say, um, the program that I was in charge of at one point had the most, um, was the highest grant received at Cal State University, um, Dominguez Hills. And that was a million, one million, 125. That was 18 years ago. But currently we're in our third grant and we still have that endowment. And I've been able to run that program. Why? Because I use my research and analytical skills that you taught me. Um, Dr. Kreiser, Kreiser. Why? Because I use my communication skills that I learned from Pastor Witherspoon. Why? Because of my leadership skills that I got from Ambassador Rhodes. Another thing, why? Because Kara is the one who helped me identify my strengths. That's, I have to say, that's one of the reasons that I got this current job, looking at my strengths and not looking at my blind sides, understanding my Clifton strengths. I was able to be powerful as I went in to do my interview. And there's no telling where I can go. Ambassador Rhodes asked me to stop saying that you're relaunching, you have launched. Mm -hmm. And I, as a, as a middle-aged homemaker returning to the school, and a lot of, there are a lot of people my age who are, who put their careers on hold to raise their families or, or to do other things, to raise their um parents and they're returning to the workforce and this is a degree that you can understand your skills talents and experiences based on these theories and take them out to the workforce so julie i think i've done all i can do <laughs> thank you you've done a great job and and you know it, it shows so is there is there anything else you'd like to say about the program that affected I you do. i want to say two other things that i i want to um I wanna tell students out there or potential students that you have to take the opportunity. I was frightened coming back into a university as a middle-aged individual. And um, I 
getting back into the workforce, I stepped up to um, Dr. Jarrett and I, things that I was able to accomplish, like the journal, bring the inaugural journal, like that, being able to do that. I was a managing editor and I'm appreciative of that. Bringing in the student alumni panel. This is the fourth alumni panel mm -hmm. that because I asked, I went in and asked, hey, this is what we need. And it was through theories and understanding and facilitation, facilitating conflicts um, that I could understand and listen to others. So I'm happy that we're doing this type of event because it helps um, keep our, our students together. And this is my first time sitting on the panel. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best advice you'd share with, with any new students or even recent graduates? Organize your work and keep your work early on. If you organize it well on to begin with, you'll be able to use that. That includes your emails that you might send. If you're using it in the workplace, organize it. Um, I wish that I had, and I'm going to tell you the capstone, I, it intimidated me, but it should not have because all the information is there and somebody is actually holding my hand as I'm walking through it step by step. So it's all on me. Um, and I think it makes it easier if you don't procrastinate on it, use your eight minute rule, take a stab at it every, Julie, you and I used to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I've shared that advice too. Just, there's yeah. so much information. It's just, it's kind of overwhelming, but you'll get through it. And, mm -hmm. and it, Professor Wilpel is amazing. Um, yeah. he really has given us everything we need to do it, but. Yeah. Well, I want to, I have to, again. A thank you to all of my professors, um, Dr. Jarrett. Um, I see everybody there, Ambassador Rhodes. I want to thank you all. Without you, um, and the the caring that you show for your students is what I experience in this department, and and I appreciate it. And Nancy Herb, Dr. Herb, I'm sorry, I thought I saw you. I'm shouting out to you too. I appreciate your leadership. Where are you? I thought I saw you. Okay, I didn't see you. All right. She was on Nicole. I think but you probably caught All right. Yeah, All right. Yeah. And, and Karen, Nancy, so thank you. Um, I want to Toro, always a Toro. I'm always an alum. Oh, Julie, may I also share this? One of the workshops that I did um, was demystifying the California civil service process. Dr. Jared is the one, that was another thing I wanted to do. And he said, do it. And we actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to say that um, of all the participants who um, fully participated, all of them are now fully employed, whether it's with the state, whether it's with the federal government or with the county. And we are planning to bring this workshop back to um, not just NCRT students, but um, two other alums, Renee Brown and Carissa, please help me pronounce Carissa's last name, but we'll be doing another workshop, uh, I believe, no, um, December, I believe it's in December, or no, November 18th, oh, and right. I'll share that information. Yeah, that's Carissa Campalia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And by yeah. the way, uh, so, uh, I wanted to just tell you that, um, that um, Syra Galvan says to say hello and was very appreciative of your work, Nicole. She did okay. go on to get a, into the labor department, the federal labor department. She now, has a federal. Work, as a result yeah, she of what she did with you. Yeah. yeah. So very good work. Uh, maybe I should just jump into and give you an acknowledgement here from, from my uh, side of things. I'm very appreciative of the fact that you really took the journal on and did all kinds of work to make that happen. In our inaugural uh, journal that we brought here from, I brought from the University of Alaska and we brought it and you brought it back to life here at the university. And I just want to give you a shout out. I'm, I'm very, uh, very much appreciative and acknowledge well, the, that, Nicole. Yeah. I and appreciate that awesome. very much. Thank you for giving well, me, letting well, me have that opportunity. But students, if you want the opportunity, you have to take it. You must make it. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Nicole, there, there's a few things that I don't, do you have a, do you have video or no? I do. Um, there's a few things that I wanted to share too. We, and, and it sounds like Dr. what Dr. Jarrett said fits right along with, in line with this, but um, Peace and Education wanted to recognize the work that you've done in getting us started and your just energy, ideas, everything with 
I don't know, hopefully everybody can see it, but with the Visionary Award, can you see it? No. Education. Oh, I yes. don't. Wait, what? What? <laughs> yeah. Can you see it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't make me cry, dude. No, that's why I waited till the end. See, it's well thought out. <laughs> because we appreciate everything you've done and, and we believe that we're here today because of what you started. So we we will have to get together so you can have the actual award, but we just wanted to say thank you. And I think Professor Valerie would like to say a few words too. So I'll let her speak. Yes, Nicole, 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 Nicole. We've had many conversations. Um, you know, Nicole was one of several students that volunteered to kind of help me with some work I was doing in the Antelope Valley with law enforcement and social justice and other issues. And after the dialogue, she was just surprised that there was this ability for community members to problem solve just through this small sort of informal process of conversation. And she was, she was shocked. So when time for her capstone, she says, I want to do my capstone around a dialogue. I want to design a dialogue. Um, I want to take this from beginning to end. And she did. She actually designed the first dialogue around um, vaccine hesitancy and, and the impact of vaccines. And we had a really good event. And right as that dialogue had concluded, the NAFTM, which is the National Association for Community Mediation, um, the RFP was released. And so I was like, hey, Nicole, guess what? Julie, we could use dialogues. We could bring this to the campus. And Nicole was like, okay. So um, I just wanna say thank you for your energy. Thank you for your vision. And thank you for always, always wanting to share to share what you know, to share what you see, and um, really just really appreciate you. Thank you, Professor Valerie. Thank you so much. You know, I don't think I said hey to you, <laughs> but <laughs> Professor Valerie has been there. I lost my dad a year ago during this time, and we had a dialogue almost a year ago, um, a year and a week ago, and um, I, this is just a, a really great program. So I can't be emotional. I'm now a strategic business advisor for the state. So I have to be professional. <laughs> I, I'd like to add something to uh, the compliments for Ms. Picada. Not a week goes by that I don't hear from her. And, <laughs> you know, it's delightful. She it, She's willing to take on some of the most difficult tasks she has done an outstanding job with Ollie. She beat up on me until I agreed to speak to her organization on China. And then she came back uh, a couple months later and wanted me to talk about the White House. So to, to say that she doesn't have initiative and the fact that this woman has that never say die spirit um, she is an example of what we hope all our students will be in terms of success um, because failure isn't an option with her. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But this ain't about me. This is about NCRP. <laughs> so I'm, if, if, this is the degree. This is the degree. Um, I do have a question for um, Dr. Jarrett, is there a certificate um, still available? Is the certificate still available through? Yes, yeah, we have, the, we have, a, we have two options. We have the post-master certificate, which is available and it's a concentration in various um, areas. You, know, you take training in particular areas like arbitration, mediation, fact-finding. And Renata, I was thinking, we've talked more about the transformative dialogue uh, course in particular that we can put on. So. There's certain areas we can build in there and we're looking at right now for that certificate. Also, we do the one-off certificate. So Renata, the other night you had your class that where you had, we gave the DERPA certification to the mediation class. And we, in fact, that was last night actually, when we had the, the, uh, that ceremony and so forth. So we do have the, the 
um, so we can certify for particular courses too that we that take place like the mediation course. And I'm also thinking transformative dialogue that we'll be putting on at some point, uh, specializing in that with the work that Renata Valerie is doing. So we do have that. And we, and we, of course we have the postmaster, the larger certificate, the post, you know, certificate still. So we have two ways to, to give certification. Yeah, thanks Nicole. And thank you for all the hard work. Really appreciate it. And the support of the program all through. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we do have one other um, alumni, or are, are you alumni, Jason? Jameson? Sorry, are you on here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yes, I, uh, I graduated in uh, December of 2020, so I am a new alumni. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience in the program? Uh, yeah, so I uh, came to NCRP. I had, uh, I studied conflict for my bachelor's, but I ended up working in politics for over a decade. Um, and when I had kids, I decided it was time to um, transition. So I actually had a mediation practice in Ventura County. Uh, and I wanted to come to NCRP uh, to make myself a, a, a better practitioner. Um, but it ended up not exactly turning out that way. I mean, it did. Uh, but that first semester, I took theories of conflict uh, with Dr. Jarrett and, um, and a research design interpretation uh, with Dr. Kreiser. And, uh, and I became obsessed with uh, theory and research within a conflict context. Um, and one of the things I loved about NCRP was it allowed me to kind of you know, loosen my leash so I could do a lot of uh, a number of independent study courses and actually um, kind of follow up on some of this work while I was taking these classes and applying all these classes to the theoretical work I was interested in. So I was really grateful for that. Well, wow, that's really interesting. That's kind of a different direction than a lot of, a lot of us have taken. So how, how did that um, come into play with your work? How did it affect the work? Yeah, so actually- you're doing already? Um, So, I, uh, I decided I'm actually, I'm doing a PhD. I sold my house in California oh, wow. uh, and uh, we sold our cars and we moved, I moved my family and my kids out to the Hague. Um, so I am oh, wow. a, a PhD researcher in the Hague. Um, I study like a, a specific cognitive heuristic uh, around resource distribution and conflict. And um, I'm, I'm researching that here on a, a national, um, international and a, post-conflict uh, settings. Um, so I'm also, uh, I was recently hired to teach mediation at UC Davis uh, and I'm doing conflict management coaching for the California State Water uh, Agency through uh, UC Davis as well. Um, so it's been a, just an incredible opportunities that followed after, after I graduated from uh, NCRP. And you feel like you're, you're particular interest of theory really um, had an impact on the work that you're doing now? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, you know, I love practice, uh, but I didn't realize how much I liked theory and research because they marry together. Um, you know, one of the reasons that NCRP is so important um, is because whether you're looking at conflict from an academic standpoint or a practitioner standpoint, this is a growth industry. Conflict uh, unfortunately, is a growth industry, um, and it's going to be for the next several decades, I would guess. Um, but also academically, you're seeing new bachelor's programs, new master's programs, new PhD programs that are coming up all, all over the world, from New Zealand to Sweden, United States. Um, so it's such an important field. Uh, it helps you whether you're in that field or it helps you in your personal life, um, helps you in your professional life, even if you're not. Uh, so uh, yeah, no, it was, it was beautiful. Sounds great. What do you hope to do in the future? Um, kind of tapping off looks like, sounds like you got some pretty great things going on right now, but um, do you see things in your future that you'd like to do with the work that you've studied? And Absolutely, done? yeah. So I, I, wanna have, I wanna have a career with one foot in academia and one foot in practice. Uh, and so if I can continue to uh, hopefully mediate and do conflict coaching um, in an international uh, level, uh, uh, consistent with like my research, uh, that would be great, but also teaching. So I'm, I'm designing, uh, I'm teaching at UC Davis, but at my university in The Hague, I'm also designing a course for, um, for conflict coaching, conflict management coaching uh, for the master's students in that program. Because 
the program I, I'm in, you have masters and PhD students that come from uh, all over the world, from Africa, Asia, Latin America, United States. Uh, and a lot of them are like early career government or um, NGO professionals. And so they're coming there to do work. But when they go back to their country, they, they might not be in a position where they can mediate, um, but they're still involved with conflict. And so uh, using conflict management coaching to uh, help them in their careers back, back home. Um, and abroad, yeah. That's, That's wonderful. What I hope Academia, uh, act research, teaching, and practice, uh, hopefully. And I can imagine you probably take a lot of what we've learned almost to another level, bringing in all the different cultures and things that come into uh, working in a program where some everybody's from so many different places. Yeah, it's not just that. I mean, that's the beautiful part. It's that, but also at uh, Dominguez Hills, right? So I'm coming from Ventura County, but the beautiful thing about this program is that you're talking about conflict, you're analyzing conflict, uh, but you're doing it with people from all over the country that have different ages, they're in different careers. And so the experiences and the perspectives uh, that you're exposed to when you're talking about conflict, they make you see conflict in a different way because it's, you know, we perceive conflict based on our experiences. So to be able to learn about how other people um, perceive conflict based off their experiences is invaluable uh, for this field. Yeah. I agree. I've, I've had some experience with just other students that I've been in classes with where I'm able to ask some questions that I never thought, like thought too personal to, you know, about cultural differences and things like that, that, um, it's just a different vibe being in the classes with, in this program where you, you get to know people well enough where you know that it's safe to, to talk about things that are, you know, right. sometimes harder to talk about. Um, what is the, maybe something that you loved about the program going through it? I know you've said a lot of things already, but is there something that really stands out? Um, man, I loved a lot of things about the program, but I think that the thing um, that was most helpful for me, um, other than like being able to talk about conflict with these different people, different age, all that stuff, um, but also it gave me the opportunity with the online setting um, and the, the way that the courses are structured, uh, it gave me, um, I think, more freedom to, uh, to go through the program in a way that was very relevant for my life and my, uh, my trajectory, right? Um, a lot of programs, you're, you're focused on that specific thing. Um, maybe it doesn't have as, you can't apply it to what you're doing, but with the online setting, um, and also just with the professors that we have, I was able to really make it something that was customized to, to my, my own life and my own identity. And I think if anyone's gonna take the program or study conflict, um, this is a, a great setting to do that in for that reason. Cause you can make it, you can take the program and customize it to your personal and your professional life uh, with a lot of freedom. That's great. I, I think I've um, pushed a few people Dr. Jarrett's way in that regard too. When, when people start talking about interest in the work that they're doing um, with peace and education, they talk about their different interests that may not be specifically what we're doing. I'm like, go, go talk to Dr. Jarrett because there's room to do things that you want to do. Um, you know, th this field relates to so many things that um, there's, it's hard to not think of something that you can connect to something you could do um, in an independent study type project. So um, I, it's interesting to have you come in and say that because I, I thought that's probably the case too. People could do more of exactly what they want to study. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to add? Can I want to jump in too. Oh, just, sorry. Just, uh, Trina, I just wanted to jump in just quickly if I could, just to say particularly about your, your research, you took the academic path in the sense, Jameson, and done some really terrific work in the academic world. It's really actually having, it's reverberating around the other universities and across the country and other places where you actually did, you've taken that the Harvard model, basically the integrated bargaining model, and really looked at that closely to look at how people get caught in resource-based disputes and then they can uh, move them to, uh, to find solutions they didn't see were there through this integration process that, uh, you know, that model talks about. But you really took that a long way. Do you want to just say a word about that? Because it's actually quite neat because that, that's leading work. That is actually leading, this is a good example of leading research in our field that's affecting other folks in the network and other universities and other scholars. So why don't you say a word or two about it? Sure. Well, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, uh, well, I was able to develop 
I was able to develop a generalized theory of conflict um, based off of zero sum cognitive bias. Um, and by taking all the new research and the new literature uh, from psychology, economics, sociology, anthropology, political science. Um, so I took that data and I synthesized it with uh, data or research from the field of conflict. Uh, my background is in um, uh, interest-based negotiation. Um, and so I applied that that, but, um, you know, uh, Dr. Jarrett's dissertation uh, on um, combining different fields of conflict. So what's great now is I'm, I'm taking that, what I did with the NCRP program, uh, and using actually conflict coaching as a methodology for collecting data, um, because you can, it's a mixed method, I can use mixed method stuff. So I'm also looking at narrative and interest-based. Um, and just, you know, the, the problem with zero-sum cognitive bias is, uh, zero sum situations are are very real sometimes, um, but it's a misapplied cognitive bias all the time. And so the beauty of interest based research or interest based practice uh, is that you can there are a lot of tools and techniques that you can use uh, to reduce people's perception and resource distribution. Um, they're misapplied cognitive bias. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you, I'll say your dissertation was actually really uh, insp inspirational oh, uh, yeah. in terms of taking different fields of conflict and, and making them work together, so. Thanks, James. And we all borrow from each other. Before me, it was David Chandler and Len yeah. Riskin and others, you know, they were doing this work and we pass along the torch. So thank you, I appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Jameson. And that'd thank be great. Um, if you want to put anything in the chat, if, if any links back to your research, either one of you, Dr. Jarrett too, I think, um, um, coming into the program, I didn't realize that it would be so easy to make those connections and do some of those things that you want to do. And that, that's what I'm hearing really from everyone is like, you have to take those opportunities and, and seek them um, because they're there. Um, there's a lot of professors in this program, really all of the professors in this program that really, um, unlike anywhere I've ever gone to school, um, are supportive and mentors for, you know, if, this first time I ever had a mentor probably really was in this program and that was Professor Valerie and the, the interest is there to help, I think is what I'm hearing from everybody. So just have to look for it, so. Absolutely, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And with that, I think he's, he's our last uh, student alumni panel this, so um, I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Jarrett. And I, and I also would like to add, I'll, I'll share some things in the chat. I know a couple of people have asking about peace and education information. Um, I can share that stuff in the chat when, when Dr. Jarrett takes, takes the stand here. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you, Julie. Uh, uh, Julie, I saw a, a Ms. Jock, who's a former student, right? I'm sorry, who? I didn't hear um, you. Um, Andrea Jock is on the line. She's a student. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey there, I'm here. I'm still, I'm starting my second year this week. So uh, looking forward to being in, in ethics with uh, Dr. Castro and Dr. Swarbrick and then uh, also intercultural conflict with Dr. Castro. And a so, wonderful student in my international class. Nice to see you again. <laughs> my pleasure. Now I'll take the floor now, Julie and, and, uh, and Bessa Rhodes to, to, to say a little, a word or two about our Professor Valerie, um, um, Renata Valerie is an amazing individual, practitioner, um, community uh, connected person, um, done amazing, really a leader in our dispute resolution, conflict resolution field in the restorative field. And uh, we're so fortunate to have Renata join us on the faculty. And I've just been appreciative all the way along of your work, Renata, and all the contributions that you're continuing to make. And I really, you know, encourage students to chat with you and to connect as with all the professors, but I want to just say a few words about you tonight and, and then give the floor to you actually to introduce our guest. But Renee, your work, you were the firm, former president of the National Community Family and Community Mediation Association. For many years, you did that job. Um, you've been connected with ACR on a number of um, panels and uh, been working with the Association for Conflict Resolution, ACR, amazing work. Um, you then worked with R Avis Ridley Thomas, Mark Ridley Thomas, Avis Ridley Thomas, uh, doing the, uh, the Days of Dialogue in Los Angeles, which they themselves are famous. I mean, people know about these across the country. 
one of the first, really, the, Avis was really the first person to make, uh, produce these dialogues um, in the community, and they were made a, a huge difference, and they were part of the modern dispute resolution uh, field now, and that you worked with Avis and um, did all kinds of good work, transformative dialogue there, but then took that work on to other fields, including Antelope Valley, where you worked with the sheriff's department recently and the students to um, improve their practices, for so the sheriff's practices in Antelope Valley. Uh, and you held dialogues, community, police, everybody was involved. You talk about how people were reluctant at first, but then they, they got into it. They, the police, including uh, chief of uh, police there and the, uh, all the other members involved in the community, and that they were able to produce a real change in terms of the change in policies and practices that everybody was grateful for, including the police and community, and improve things. A really an example of how this work improves civil society, civil society practices. I mentioned earlier our mission. So it fits really well with that. And so we're very grateful to have you on faculty or working with us and to support your work. And recently you worked, of course, with Julie Ali and on this NAFCAM grant, this National Association of Family and Community community mediators and the JAMS organization, another community organization that, um, you know, it's a, it, it really um, uh, is a, an organization for mediators and arbitrators, along with AAA, American Arbitration Association. That with JAMS, you, you've got a, a scholarship, a fund that now you'll be able to continue to do transformative dialogue, dialogue work that you were doing with Ollie and other, and our, our program at the university and in the community and that that's gonna continue forward that work. And so I just want us to give you a shout out and appreciation here for all that work and your work, your contributions to the field. Um, and you know, I really see you as a leader in, a, in, in our field and I wanted to acknowledge you as such right now and, and, and you know, at our, our welcome event. And then I'm gonna give the floor over to you now to introduce the guests that we have to come and speak. Thanks very much, Renata. Keep doing all the great work. Big appreciate Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I was just so happy that we were able um, to get the, the mini grant. In fact, we were the only university to be awarded the uh, mini grant. So I'm, I'm extremely proud of that and, and very proud of the NCRP students who have just taken this entire initiative on. It's student led. They designed these dialogues from you know getting together, figuring out the questions, evaluation, designing the prompts, you know, the marketing, the outreach. I mean, it's just completely student led. And I'm just kind of sitting there in the background, um, not doing too much, but um, I'm just, I'm extremely happy. I'm extremely happy that the, the program is here. And, you know, I would love to help any student who was interested in doing this work, because I do think there's a value that we don't hear about particularly when you use, you know, communication as a problem solving tool, something so simple to bring people together and have them sit and have a conversation and to see the change that can come out of that, whether or not that that's, you know, that's a policy change or a procedural change or a systems change, but change does occur. It's just opening the space and allowing people to be authentic and having that, that real conversation. So thank you, I, I appreciate it, I love the work I do. But now I get to have um, an opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to introduce our keynote speakers. The first one is a very lovely lady, Dr. Stephanie Myers. I've worked with Dr. Myers now for, um, I wanna say over a year, we worked on the uh, committee, the, the de-escalation advocacy committee. She's been a leader. She actually chairs our committee. Um, but then I guess over the last few months working with her on the Youth Summit, and that's really uh, an effort that Black Women for Positive Change puts forth every year to engage youth and to really teach them, educate them, listen to them about things that they can do other than to use violence. So it's it's a wonderful opportunity. So I get the chance to introduce you tonight, Dr. Myers. So I'd like to tell you about Dr. Stephanie Myers. She's a native Californian and a Toro. 
from the class of 1971. She lives in Washington, D.C. She co-owns um, R.J. Myers Publishing Company with her husband. She's an author. And her most recent book is Invisible Queen. It's about Queen Charlotte, um, the Queen of England, the mixed race Queen of England. And um, actually, Dr. Myers educated me. I had, had no idea, as I, and I love Charlotte, you know, the historical context behind that. So thank you for that piece of history. Um, Dr. Myers serves as presidential appointee for 12 years and in the capacity as director of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, she authorized the first commercial space launch of a private satellite on a private rocket. She was also the assistant secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for five years. She also was the manager of the Say No to Drugs campaign. Does anybody remember that, Say No to Drugs? I do. I know my kids do. Um, currently, Dr. Myers is the national co-chair of Black Women for Positive Change, which started as Black Women for Obama. For 12 years, they have sponsored annual weeks of nonviolence, and this year in October is the month of families, nonviolence, and opportunities. And Black Women for Positive Change is a multicultural, interfaith, intergenerational organization of women and good brothers, good men who are dedicated to changing the culture of violence. And I am to welcome and to thank Dr. Stephanie Myers for being here with us this evening. Well, thank you very, very much, Renata. I appreciate your introduction and I'm gonna to try to pull up my, uh, my slides here so we can talk about this topic here together. Okay, thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure to listen to Toros at Dominguez Hills University talking. I was at the school when the school had 500 students and we were in a small apartment building. And on occasion, we would take the classes outside because there were only 30 of us and the professors would take us out on the grass. So it's been a real honor and a real privilege to hear you talking today. And I just wanna say that I really appreciate the tone that I'm getting from all of the speakers that have spoken today. Right now, we're in an incredibly adversarial time in US history. And to be able to spend an hour listening to all of you with respect of each other, positive, has just been outstanding. This evening, I wanna talk with you about opportunities for changing American culture, because this is really where I think we are right now. We have got to realize that we have to move into a whole new world. Now I'm trying to click this slide and it isn't working. Okay, maybe it is. Okay, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, I wanted to share with you just a few things about my experience at Dominguez because as I listen to you talk and I see how Dominguez has grown, it's really kind of interesting because we all go on a journey. And as you plan your life's career, the beginning, the middle, the end is all so key in your journey. So my journey at Dominguez Hills with the 500 students, white, black, Asian, Latino, we decided to start a group called Students Interested in Black America. It was a multicultural group. This was during the 60s when everything was really heavy with the Panthers and the US organization. But our first initiative was to work together, much the way I'm seeing you tonight working together. Now we did flip the group into Black Students Union because that's what was happening at all the campuses and we wanted to be in tune with that. But I really encourage students, no matter what age they are or, or whatever it is they're doing to get involved with student government. Because when you talk about mentorship and opportunities, being at the decision-making table as a part of your journey, you have to get there and learn how to make decisions. Uh, during the time I was at Dominguez, we would occasionally take over the administration building because, you know, Black Student Unions, we had to go shut down the uh, campus from time to time. And because Dr. Leo Kane was the president and had this tone that has continued on at the school, he would say to me, okay, Stephanie, now if the Black Student Union is gonna come in and take over my office, give me a call, let me know, and I'll take an extended lunch. Just don't burn my, just don't burn my couch. <laughs> and you guys can have it for a few hours. 
So we would come in all strong. We're going to take over the administration building, but we had kind of worked it out in advance. So it was a real, a real education to interface with a man who was the CEO of the university and to learn at a, at a fairly young age how to operate. We also at Dominguez were very proud that we created one of the first African-American studies programs in the state of California. And that was a real honor for us to participate with. I was really glad to see that um, you have here in the negotiation, conflict, resolution, and peace building program, you have a group you call your friends, I believe it was. And that's excellent because mentors, family members, faculty, community leaders, are all part of this village. And the collaboration is so critical. And it's really important for those mentors to be positive and not skeptical or negative when you're hearing new ideas. I'll give you an example. When I left the Black Students Union movement, I got very active in the Democratic Party in California. And then I joined the Coro Foundation. And I encourage you all to send students to Coro. It's headquartered downtown LA and students get opportunities to meet all kinds of elected officials. So when I did my graduate work there, Ronald Reagan was president. He was governor, excuse me. He was governor of California. And I'm this activist, activist black student. I wanna change the world. And I met him during our interactive sessions during the Coro Foundation. I used to write him letters and say, look, you're not doing enough for black people. You should be doing more. You should be doing this. Well, when he ran for office and became president, his office said, okay, you have a lot of ideas about the black community. Why don't you come to Washington and help? My mentors were not skeptical. They could have knocked me down right then and said, are you kidding? After all the terrible reputation Governor uh, Reagan has had with the black community, you want to go to Washington with him? They didn't say that. My father said, power is access. If you are close to the decision maker, you can have power. And even if this is a person that you have some issues with, get to where the center of power is. So I encourage all of the Toros to connect with these terrific opportunities that you have. And for the mentors, please be open-minded. Don't shut your students down when they come up with kind of a idea out of the box. Now, right now, as you all know, we're in this really critical time with the COVID pandemic, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I was there when the first AIDS patient was announced at HHS, and I went through five years of the whole early years of the AIDS crisis. I've never seen so much confusion at the national level over policy. Do you have a vaccine that's safe or not? Do you have um, booster shots or not? Are they going to come out for everyone or just some people? So we're really in an incredible time, and we see the pressure that's happening in the families. Domestic violence is at an all-time high. We're seeing anger. Every day you read news stories about all kinds of bizarre deaths and murders. So America's at a time where people who are experts like you in conflict resolution, this is like a true, I'm going to call it a blessing because that's really what it is to hear you talk about the education that you're sharing with each other. So far in America, we've had 31,000 deaths so far in 2021. This is a historic number. We are in a crisis. We know that the unemployment benefits are ending. The eviction ban is ending. The homeless population, it breaks my heart when I go out to my beloved Venice Beach and out there at the beach here in Southern California and see the homeless populations. And of course, environmental change. So we need people today who are people like all of you, people who understand what conflict is and, and more importantly, understand how to resolve it and how to mediate it. I'm so impressed with Julie Ali, with uh, Professor Renata Valry, really just outstanding people who are working there on the faculties. And we know that we need you to think about how do we change this system? Because that's really what we're up against. Systemic change is needed in our education system. We've got to get this conflict resolution knowledge down to elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. It's critical for us to find ways to think big and promote your ideas. I encourage you, think about making movies. Think about producing uh, all kinds of creative things. Think about the technology and how you can do that. And work with the leaders in your environment 
and educate them about the need for change. The dialogues that you've been talking about are fascinating. And those dialogues need to include people at the very, very top, the CEOs, as well as the people in the middle and the people at the bottom. I really am impressed to hear the research that's going on. I loved what Jameson was talking about with all of the studies and research that he's doing. And I encourage the department to integrate technology and robotics and artificial intelligence into conflict resolution. How does technology and how will robotics impact this issue? How are they going to impact violence? I don't know. But if we're going to have robotics taking over many of our factories, what impact is that going to have? Are, we, are they going to be making robots to be violent? Already we know we have drones uh, you know, firing bombs across the world. So what does this all mean? Mm -hmm. We also have to look at, and I encourage you all to start writing your books. It takes you a couple of years to get that book done. But all of you who have so many talents and so much insight, ambassadors and professors and graduate students, write those books. It's important for you to put your ideas into place. Don't wait. Don't think that someone else has it better than you. We have to figure out how to stop systemic racism and white supremacy. It's something that is core and critical to the violence in this country. America was started with violence. We know the Native American situation was violent. Slavery was violent. So it's gone on and on. And these are issues that have to, the broader issue of conflict resolution has to be applied to these systems. This is what we do with Black Women for Positive Change. We try to talk about all these issues. How can we stop access to weapons? How can we increase access to mental health? This is a real crisis. In the African-American community, we only have 3% of uh, psychiatrists, 3%. But we know that if you have someone who needs mental health counseling, it's best that they go to someone who understands their culture. Well, if we don't have mental health professionals who understand black culture, that's an automatic disconnect. So I encourage our universities to put a priority on producing mental health professionals. And then another challenge is we have to look at how to export this concept and all the study that you're doing in conflict resolution to the larger society. How do we make it a norm? How do we keep it from being this academic graduate high level intellectual issue and break it down to where it becomes a part of society. We know that systemic change is, is possible. We've all seen it. Women used to be in the kitchen. They're now CEOs, senators, and, and vice presidents of the United States. Um, we established Black Women for Obama when he was running uh, for, for office and helped flip Virginia to become blue for the first time in many years because we were out there being visible. I encourage all of you, get involved in politics. We have got a very low quality of individual in public office these days. At the local state levels, we have got to get higher levels of people in politics. It's not enough to go vote. Sorry, you got to go and run. And, and as, as Professor Renata mentioned, we started the week of nonviolence. And actually our organization, Black Women for Positive Change, grew out of Black Women for Obama. After he had his election and he was continuing with his reelection, we decided, okay, we either need to stop or keep going. Well, we decided to keep going. And originally our, our purpose was going to be to build economic strength and economic development in the Black community. Then we got more knowledgeable about all this violence. And we said, wait a minute, how in the world can we expect our young people to go to school and into the job marketplace if they're getting killed in the street? So we established a nonviolence initiative. And we were just a group of women and good brothers who just decided to do this. So you don't have to be operating at the national level. Create something you think can work. We started the month of nonviolence. It started out as a day of nonviolence. And then we went to a week. Now this year, we're at a month. And we have people all over the country organizing their own events. This is our way of trying to change the culture, get the dialogue going, get the conversation, get the concepts out there. Professor Renata Valry and uh, Julie Ali are leaders of our youth summit. And this is terrific because they're going to be working with young people all over the country, 
trying to bring them into dialogue and help them realize they have to have a voice and they have to have a say. We had a young man who um, I went to an event in Pittsburgh a few years ago, and he, I asked him the question, why are you young people so angry? What is going on with you? What is this conflict all about? And I was standing with the police chief because we work a lot with law enforcement as well. And the young man said to me, look, when I wake up in the morning, I'm fighting with my siblings for the first hour that I'm out of bed. My mom is a single mom. She's trying to get to work and she's yelling at us and telling us to get dressed and go to school. When I leave the house, the guys on the street are bothering me and bugging me and talking about what I'm wearing. And I'm on my way to the bus. When I get to the bus, I have to fight on the school bus with the kids on the bus all the way to school. He says, by the time I get to school, I've had an hour and a half of conflict. So the first person who says anything to me, I'm ready to deck him. So then I asked him, okay, he was 18 years old. What can we do? And his answer was, your generation and my parents' generation, the Xers, you guys have failed to give us vision. You have failed to give us dreams. So we are really now believing that one of the things we've got to do with America is push opportunities. We have got to help people realize that opportunities are the answer to violence in many cases. So one of the ways that we did that is we approached a member of Congress and we said, look, we need to teach our kids how to be leaders in de-escalation. We need to teach our teachers, our health professionals, our young people, how to de-escalate a situation. What to do when somebody comes in with that gun into the school? What do you do when someone comes to the Walmart and wants to start shooting people and you're in the parking lot? How can you become a leader? So working with Congresswoman Gwen Moore, who's from Wisconsin, we helped her draft the uh, National Community Violence De-Escalation Training Act. It's been introduced three times, it was introduced again in um, July 2021, and this bill would provide over $100 million over a period of three to five years to fund training in de-escalation. Now, this is something that the Departments of Conflict Resolution should take the lead on because you are the ones who should be working to teach de-escalation to our citizens. But we can't get the bill until it passes. And right now the Congress doesn't seem to be interested. We can't even get it into the committee. So we're trying to push for congressional votes. We're going to be campaigning during the month of nonviolence, asking people to talk to their congressmen, because if we're gonna change the culture, we have to start at the beginning. Now law enforcement believes the de-escalation should be limited to them. Law enforcement doesn't like the idea that a professor or a teacher or a health professional might step up. And we work very closely with the National Community Mediation Association, which Renee is a part of, and that's their whole idea, that community people should be able to enter conflict and help to resolve it. We believe in that also, but most of the law enforcement officers do not. We just submitted a proposal working in partnership with the university to the Department of Justice to help produce de-escalation training for law enforcement. We approached 10 police departments to ask them to partner with us and they all said, no, not interested. They said, we do our own de-escalation. We don't need the community involved. Well, we do need the community involved. And so we have to get out there and, and get those messages across. So I encourage all of you brilliant people, all of my Toros that I'm proud of here, Writing legislation is not a miracle. It just means you get with your local congressperson and put the pressure on them, write a bill and get them to introduce it. That's what they're there for. They're making their $193,000 a year. We have to make these people work for it. Pursuing opportunities at young ages, middle ages, older ages, mentorship is everything. And I'm so glad to hear you refer to, and it was great to hear uh, Nicole talk about her mentors. That's beautiful. So you already know what it is and you know how networks work and how activism is so critical. I can't say it enough because that certainly has been the story of my life. I just thought I'd throw in a couple of examples. 
One of my middle school teachers was a woman named Dr. Louise White Cashin. She became a sorority member. I'm a Delta Sigma Theta member. And when it was time for me to make this bizarre choice to go into the Reagan administration, she's a mentor who supported me. And when I moved to Washington, I moved into her house for the first three years I was here. Mentorship, people who care about you will do all kinds of things. And as you can see her here with, with Secretary Ralph Bunch, she was a real leader and a woman who introduced me to people all over the country. And I just couldn't say enough about her. Another mentor is a very close friend of Dr. Thomas Parham, the beloved president of Dominguez Hills. And his name was Dr. Joseph White. I was lucky because he was my first cousin. And so I had a chance to listen to him across the dinner table. But for all of you, don't downplay your relatives. If you have relatives who are achievers, or if you're one of the achievers in the family, take the time to spend it with those young people and mentor them. Joe used to come by Dominguez Hills campus on his way, he was at UC Irvine, and check on me all the time. He would just show up. And so he wrote a book. He, he is now known as the father of Black psychology. And you can Google his name, Dr. Joseph White, the father of Black psychology. And in two weeks, his daughter will be uh, sworn in as the president of DePaul University in Indiana. So mentorship definitely works. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Coro Foundation is an organization that you, you should really get close to in, in Los Angeles because they're very connected with elected officials all over the country. And maybe um, a Toro can get in the program or have someone in every year. But it's very important that America has models that work. And right now our models are not working. So I really reach out and encourage you to think about how we can replace the dysfunctional models in this country. I would like to see Cal State University at Dominguez Hills perceived as the model institution or certainly one of the top 10 model institutions, not only in America, but in the world, with actually coming up with the specific work that you're doing, and you're already doing it. So market it, sell it, get it out there, show people how they can balance violence with interventions. Our youth summit and our youth concert, we're having trouble recruiting kids right now. We need help. We need help because we've got the model and one of the things with Black Women for Positive Change, we have these tremendous people who are putting together workshops on de-escalation of violence, the Youth Summit, domestic violence, all these themes. Now we have to fill up the room. And that's the hard part. A lot of times we end up talking to each other. So we have to find a way to connect with the larger society. I believe that America can be the role model for the world as it was intended to be where we can blend equity, compassion, brotherhood, and justice. We can do this, but it's really gonna take all of us. And we're at a crisis right now. You can see the statistics, it's half and half. And I've worked on both sides of the aisle. I was with the Reaganites and I was with the Obama team. So I'm an independent and I believe you go to where you can help influence the decisions. We have to teach America how to agree to disagree. And that's what you do. That's your specialty. So Toros and the National Conflict Resolution Program can be a model to change the culture of violence in America. Why not? Why not you? Why not us? We believe that we can do it. So I want to th say thank you to Dr. Jarrett for hosting this program this evening and to Renata and to my buddies, uh, Julie, and to the rest. Appreciate what you're doing. And let's, let's move forward. We've got to save our country and we're definitely at risk right now. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you're absolutely correct. There's, I, I think one of the things we're hearing from the youth, at least from the Gen Z's that you've connected us with, is that there is a need for encouragement and support to help them find their voice, to help them find their way. And that's something they feel that they have uh, missed out on that they're not getting that. And so that is, you know, one of the, the beauties of this summit and, and we hope will be a, a positive outcome is that they will have an opportunity to share their voice and get connected to those resources and, you know, work with each other and, and one another in community too, 
to see how they can create change for themselves for you know for the future so i really appreciate i'm so i'm so happy to to be a part of the planning for the summit and i look forward to to the change because i do believe we have nala and dylan and you know just some some great future leaders and I think all they need is a little support. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Miller a question. Dr. Sorry. Miller, um, when you were at Coro, was Dan Smith a, uh, a member with you? Oh my goodness, Mr. Ambassador. When I was at Los mm -hmm. Angeles High School, Dan Smith and I were classmates and, and we were both in Coro together in the same class. And when we came to Washington, D.C., we came together and Dan was in the White House and we worked very closely. We were a team for most of our lives and I miss him so much. Um, and do you remember Steve Rhodes, who was a part of that White House? Oh, wow. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a small world. It is an absolutely small world. Well, it's just a pleasure to see you, Mr. Ambassador. Wonderful. And there you are, Domingos. That is great. It's, I'm just following in your footsteps. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I want to follow yours. Well, unfortunately, we lost Dan uh, some years ago. And it's something I haven't gotten over yet. But this was a young man who came into the White House. And, and he was part of the Reagan administration. But he fought like crazy for the HBCUs. And I fought like crazy to create the Office of Minority Health. And we did it. And we were able to represent our people, even in an environment. And Ambassador Steve Rhodes was right there. And I know your work was outstanding. Um, Dan was president of a historically Black college for a while, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Doctor, it's been a pleasure to listen to your presentation. And it's great to see you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's amazing. She really is amazing. So we have our next keynote speaker, someone that just recently had an opportunity to meet. Um, just an amazing man. Vincent. I'm going to get it right, Vincent. Flyer? Quick. Okay, tell me, Vincent. Claire, like uh, Claire. Claire with a P. Claire. So Vincent joined the Department of Justice, the Community Relations Section. Um, and for those of you who don't know, they are our federal stealth, very quietly going to communities, peacemakers. Um, he had a decorated career in law enforcement with LA County Sheriff's Department. He was in the United States Marine Corps. He was active duty and reserve components. He worked many assignments during his tenure with the Sheriff's Department. Most notable included establishing community outreach programs, training and education, public information, and being a longtime crisis negotiator, where he got an opportunity to work with many of the Southern California tactical teams during high risk incidents. He's also, or was also an entry infantry officer in the military occupational specialty. He retired as a Colonel. Whoa, <laughs> Vincent, you didn't tell me that when we talked. I've done, worked some, on a, <laughs> I've done some things in my life. Uh, you've done, a, yeah, some things, okay. Um, as a colonel, he worked on a multitude of tactical operational and staff assignments. One of the things I found out in, in talking to Vincent is that he's an avid believer in, in seeking professional growth. And when you talk about mentorship, the first thing he said to me is, I want to be a resource. I want to be a mentor to, you know, to the students here at CSUBH. And so I appreciate that. And I can't say enough about, you know, just that first introduction and you extending that kindness. So thank you for that. Uh, Vincent earned his Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Houston, a Master's of Business from, the, from National University, and most recently, 
a doctor of education and organizational leadership from Brandon University. For the past 11 years, he's been so quiet. He's been an adjunct professor here at CSUDH. He's also a professor at El Camino College. He teaches administration of justice courses. He's extremely passionate. And again, you can hear it in his voice if you have any time just to talk with him about teaching and mentoring uh, students. Um, he's had some students that he's worked with, he's mentored, that have gone on to pursue, to pursue higher education. They're working in various careers in different community-based organizations, law enforcement, and military service. And Vincent and his wonderful team will be working with NCRP to put together a training on facilitating difficult conversations in communities. So I'm looking forward to that. So without ado, here is Vincent. He has been absolutely wonderful to, to work with, to talk with, and I just can't wait to hear, hear you talk, Vincent. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Wow, I've never had anybody introduce me with so much passion. So I feel just, I'm just overjoyed to be here with you all and share the same space with you. So I, I'm like I said, if I'm a man, I'm not supposed to cry. But if I if I if I could, I would right now because uh, I am so excited about being here, and just hearing what I've heard from the students, hearing just the passion from the other instructors there, just makes me feel good about number one being a Toro. Uh, Two, about the line of work that I'm doing now with, with uh, you know, negotiation and peace. Because at the end of the day, what do we all want? We all want peace, no matter if it's on a federal level or a state level or uh, peace in our homes. So what you're learning in school is applied. And I heard one of the students talk about how this stuff applies to like everything because it, re it really does. It really applies. So uh, thank you to the prior speaker. One thing that uh, you said, uh, Dr. Myers, that uh, kind of uh, resonated with me was the, the CORAL program. Uh, quick story, work in the Sheriff's Department, again, involved in mentorship. Uh, we had a CORAL fellow that came through uh, the Sheriff's Department, was working for the Sheriff's Department. That uh, She's an African-American female that I kind of bonded with. And after her time with CORAL, we kept in contact with. She did some other things, and she is now a first-year law student in, uh, at Arizona State. Fully funded. I mean, if you, if you read her, uh, her her bio that she sent me, she's got more money uh, given to her because she's kind of like this hardworking person. So I have this kind of catchphrase because we talk about like resources and uh, making things happen that I talk to my students about and I teach uh, criminal justice classes. And I always tell them, hashtag the hustle is real. Uh, what that means is you have to make opportunities uh, present themselves to yourself. And I'm hearing that resonate with what the students are saying. You truly have to do that. And um, just so you know, uh, uh, Professor Valerie, I added one more school to my, uh, to my repertoire. I'm now teaching graduate courses at uh, Colorado State uh, Global. So again, hashtag the hustle is real. I'm just kind of wound like that. And that's what I'm hearing being said here. So again, I'm overjoyed about being here. So I'm here to talk to you tonight about what we do just another facet of maybe a career choice that you may want to look into as, as students uh, within the federal government. I work for uh, Department of Justice uh, in our community relations section, and we are what we call America's peacekeepers. I'm going to share kind of a PowerPoint with you just so you can kind of get a better guide about what we do. So think of this when I go through the PowerPoint, like, wow, the stuff that I'm learning in school applies to what you're doing and we deal with communities that are in conflict versus some of the other jobs within the negotiation fields deal with different aspects. So all our work is with communities. So before I share my PowerPoint, I'm just going to throw out some names. Uh, and I know you've heard the names before. George Floyd, Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, Stephon Clark, Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, Michael Brown, and the list could go on and on and on and on and on, uh, but, I, but I won't do that. Uh, the reason why I bring these names up is because, uh, as uh, Professor Valerie mentioned, we are kind of stealth. You wouldn't know that we're involved in these conflicts and organize many community meetings uh, with, you know, organizations, with, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, folks on the ground there. We deploy to incidents uh, across the nation. So again, there's many more conflicts that, that uh, we've become involved in, but you never really hear about our services and that's, it's by design. What we do is kind of confidential. The clients that we deal with, the organizations that we deal with, the people that we deal with, we don't let it out. We, we're we're kind of uh, media adverse. Uh, we don't do press releases. We don't do, uh, you know, we're not present in the media when uh, organizations have, uh, you know, press conferences. You, you'll never see anybody from my organization there. We're behind the scenes doing the work. So on that, I'm going to share my screen. So I think you can see it. So let me go to uh, the other view here. Oops, what did I just do? So I think if you go to a slideshow, Vincent, at the, at the top next to animations. Okay. Here we go. So this is kind of how we're structured. So we have 10 uh, regional offices throughout the nation. And the regions that I supervise, uh, if you look at the map, I have basically from Colorado to the West. So I have three regions. When I got hired, I thought I was only getting hired for like, like one region, which is the Western region, which encompasses California, Nevada, uh, Washington, uh, Arizona, uh, Alaska, and Hawaii, and Guam. But then they said, you know, we're kind of shorthanded. We need you to supervise two other regions. So I have uh, the Pacific Northwest and the Rocky Mountain states. So I have a pretty big geographical area. Now you're probably saying, well, you probably have a lot of staff. I, I don't. I have five people for that whole region. So in Southern California, I have two people that are, uh, we call them conciliators. That's their title. They're here in Southern California, and I have one up north in the San Francisco area. And our region is kind of divided by, uh, and everybody has a certain parts of the region. And then I, and uh, from my Pacific Northwest area, I have one person. And then in my Rocky Mountain states, I have one person. So again, a large, very large geographical area. So there's, I'm what's considered a regional director. So I report to our um, associate director, who is based out of like our Washington office, even though everybody right now is working virtually, um, you know, telecom telecommuting or teleworking. Then my supervisor reports to our deputy director. Again, she's based out of Washington. We have a position who's a political appointee, although we haven't had a political appointee for quite some time. So we're hoping with uh, the change of administration, with the new attorney general uh, in place, he's been here for a while, that we're going to get a political point to you to kind of give us a little more uh, guidance as far as what we're doing, not that we're doing uh, anything wrong right now. So how do we do what we do? So we've been around for a very long time, since 1964. So we were created under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you look at this picture, you'll see some pretty prominent people there from Martin Luther King, Lyndon B. Johnson, um, and there's other people in that you probably recognize. So uh, based out of that act, uh, our organization was kind of born. We are America's uh, peacekeepers. We are a federal agency, and we deal with communities that are in conflict and tensions arising from differences of race, color, and national origin. So if something happened around the world, you know, United States, that dealt what we call jurisdictional areas at that time, we could get involved and reach out to organizations and say, hey, we're from the federal government. We understand you may have a problem. We have some resources that we can uh, kind of assist you with, some programs we can assist you with. And if an organization wanted to take our services, they could, but they could decline. So we don't really have teeth. We're not an investigatory agency. So a lot of times when folks talk about Department of Justice is here or they're snooping around, they think about that investigatory side. They think of the patterns and practice side. We are not that. We have dialogue with them, but we are not them. 
Uh, we don't share information with them. When we do, it's very limited information because we have an interest in keeping our stakeholders uh, confidential. So during uh, former President Obama's era in 2009, uh, and you guys probably heard of the Hate Crimes Prevention Act, um, uh, our role was expanded to include these uh, additional jurisdictional areas, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, race, color, and national origin. So you can see our role has increased since 1964. So we have a, uh, a lot more jurisdictional areas that we can provide services for. And it has to deal, one of our catchphrases is, is there conflict around this incident? Then we can kind of get involved. So we're an impartial agency, we are voluntary. I have this term that I like to say, you know, um, if it's free, give me three, our services are free. And what's unique about us is we deal with incidents that happen around the world, you know, right around the nation, I should say. So we bring from a perspective of best practices, you know, what are they doing in, you know, say California to a, maybe a state in say Indiana, what are they doing that's maybe a best or better practices that way we kind of share that with the stakeholders we deal with. We're confidential and we're impartial. So we have to kind of toe that line. I'm former law enforcement. So I really had to kind of step out my comfort zone because I know policing. I kind of know the culture, but to do an effective job here and to supervise the people I supervise, I have to be very, very impartial. And I was always kind of wound like that anyway. Uh, when I was working in law enforcement, I understood perspectives, especially me being, you know, say an African-American male, an African-American male who grew up in the inner city, an African-American male who been stopped by, you know, say law enforcement in, in his lifetime. So I kind of under, un, always understood different perspectives. So the transition, although I've had a shift, was really not that difficult because I, my, at all the jobs I've had in law enforcement, the ones that I felt were more impactful were the ones where I had dealings with communities. So what do we do? So we uh, facilitate uh, dialogues. I heard a lot of that in the prior uh, talk tonight. Uh, we, what's good about us is because we are the federal government, we can throw out that I'm from Department of Justice, perhaps get people to talk in a setting which they wouldn't normally win. And you know, me and Professor Valerie have had this conversation about, you know, a win is just getting people who would not ordinarily talk in, in a room or a virtual space to sit down and say something. At least you're starting that conversation. So we convene parties in dialogue to identify issues and possible solutions. Uh, we're mediators. Uh, we can bring structured uh, processes, although our mediations, when people sign, are not, uh, they're not binding. Uh, we do a lot of consultation, you know, technical assistance. We sit on a lot of working groups to give you know, best practices you know, around the nation. Uh, and again, I've heard this term evidence-based from one of the other speakers. So we're very much uh, rooted in evidence-based. Is what we're doing working? Again, best and better practices. And we have some training programs, some off-the-shelf training programs that we can provide, which I'll kind of get into. So who do we work with? So if you look at this slide here, you see a multitude of people, you know, all different organizations from law enforcement, which unfortunately is probably the uh, agency we have most of our dealings with just because of kind of what's going on around the world. You know, tribal nations, uh, you know, school organizations, which uh, Professor uh, Valerie talked about the program we'll be doing at Cal State Dominguez that we are both excited about. Uh, uh, just civic groups, you know, um, NGOs, uh, uh, members of the LGBT plus community, you know, governmental organizations, religious organizations. So anybody that maybe have a conflict where there's community tension, uh, we can lend some assistance to. So our programs are grouped into a, a couple of different realms. One of them is administration of justice. So these are the programs that we have that are under our, our administration of justice realm, engaging and building relationships with transgender communities. Out of all the ones that are here on this list here, this one is probably picking up steam more than any other ones. We're getting a lot of requests for this program. We bring in subject matter experts around the nation that we have collaborated with, we put them through a training so they can kind of uh, talk, I guess the government language, so to speak, uh, in a program that's uh, beneficial for everybody. Uh, and I've been involved in a number of these in my short tenure there uh, with DOJ. Uh, strengthening police and community partnership, 
partnerships, we call it SPCP, engaging and building partnerships with Muslim Americans, engaging and building partnerships with Sikh Americans, and, and we can customize uh, sessions for uh, personnel as well. Like the one we're gonna be doing with uh, uh, Cal State Dominguez, it's kind of an off the shelf program, but we can tailor that to meet the needs of a sta uh, our stakeholder, which you know, in this case, would be Cal State Dominguez. So under our educational realm, uh, again, we deal with a lot of different agencies. We have what's called our school spirit program. It's a student uh, problem identification program. And this is mainly for like uh, uh, high schools and, and junior high schools where there's an identified problem. We work with uh, school administrators and school staff because we want everybody to be heard to include uh, the youth that attend school there and come up with common solutions that uh, schools can work through. Our campus site uh, program, Campus Spirit, and again, customized services. And I, I put through an FMAC there because that's one that we'll be doing with uh, Cal State Dominguez. And our proposed date is October, 2021. So it's coming around the corner. We are starting that planning phase now. And then our dialogue on race one that we do, uh, like I know the school has done similar one, which is good. Uh, we're, when we come in and try to assist, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's about bringing peace. We're not trying to push a program on anybody. We just want, you know, peace, the problem to be resolved. So we have to partner with somebody. We're, we're fine with taking the back seat. We just want problems to be uh, you know, addressed uh, uh, equitably and, and, and correctly. So let's move on to, oops. So again, just some of the other programs that really don't apply to, uh, to uh, kind of what we're doing in the school setting. Uh, we assist with our uh, setting up police community advisory boards, which we're seeing a lot of that done around the nation. So we've worked with, uh, again, I don't, I don't want to name agencies, but we've done quite a bit of this work post, you know, the start or restart, I should say, of the social justice move. We're getting a lot of requests for agencies to come and assist with starting police community advisory boards. I'm gonna kind of skip through some of these slides real quick. And let's talk about the school spirit program. Uh, it's an eight hour program. We bring together, again, like I talked about, uh, student leaders, administrators, faculty members, as I talked about, campus law enforcement to identify problems and help uh, organizations work through, through problems together uh, to bring out uh, resolutions for issues they're having. So the goal, the reason why we do this is to, you know, why you would want to host a program is to improve, you know, relationships, communication. Uh, again, we are truly into collaborating, bringing all sides together so we can have equitable solutions, solutions and prevent these incidents from happening, happening again. Um, another one is picking up steam and some of the work we're doing is like bias incidents, you know, with uh, uh, AAPI issues that are, have, occurred around the nation, you know, most recently, uh, we're staying and doing a lot of work with, uh, say, bias incidents uh, and hate crimes and tensions that arise as a result of uh, these, these types of incidents. I'm gonna unshare my screen because I just realized that I pulled up the wrong PowerPoint similar. So I'm gonna unshare and go to this other PowerPoint. I apologize for that. Uh, Vince, as we as you do that, I just say, we just had some sort of explosion or rolling something in Carson. And many of us I think are here just experienced that. Thought the house was gonna come down uh, shaking and really bad. So I don't yeah, know. Really. It was a yeah, I don't know. What it was, but I think we maybe had a big earthquake. I think if people it was a four point six earthquake. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Yeah, but I I'm think it was right. centered in Carson. Everybody yeah, okay? I'm sitting right here on campus. Okay, guy, you okay up there? Is everything okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm still on right. campus. Okay, I hope everybody's okay. Yeah, pretty serious uh, earthquake. Yeah, well, we're closed, but I'm still here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, man. Be safe. Sorry, Vincent. So I'm going to kind of shift gears now and talk about uh, 
an opportunity because, uh, you know, mentorship, I've heard that as one of our themes here and using resources. Uh, and again, feel free to use me as a resource. So uh, we have a internship program, uh, it's a competitive internship program that uh, I want to make available to students because you can apply now without me even having to say that if you go to our website. And our, the website's here on the screen. So if you go to this site, you can see information about our, our website. Uh, I mean, uh, information on the website about our, our, our uh, uh, internship program. So we host intern, interns uh, throughout the, the fall and the spring semesters. We currently ha now have interns that started in the summer and are working for us now. Um, I will have to say though, is when you apply, it's quite a long process because there's a background check that's involved in that. So if you're so interested in the program and you want to do it maybe in the spring, the time to do it is like now, because it's going to take you probably about three months for everything to clear that process for you to be you know, able to, to, to be an intern. So what we do is we'll assign to one of our geographical areas. Uh, like uh, for me, I have three interns, one working in the West Coast, one in my Pacific Northwest region, and one in my uh, Rocky Mountain states. And they're all students because again, it's virtual right now, uh, just because of you know, COVID thing. So even though they're, they actually go to school on the East Coast, but they're you know, assisting us from, from where they are. So I would like to see students from a school that I have a relationship with be part of our internship program. To my knowledge, they've only been there eight months. I don't think we've ever had anybody from Cal State Dominguez be part of the internship. Now, I, I may be wrong, uh, especially knowing the richness of this program. I mean, uh, and we have a number of our conciliators who have come from um, NCRP type programs. Uh, so, and I, I love the practitioner base program. And I love the fact that your professors are so engaged with the students. So that just makes me feel good about if you did apply, I knew that I am get, will be getting a top-notch student. I'm not saying that I have a say-so in who gets hired, but I'll put this out there. I am the regional director of, you know, three different areas. So, and I'm going to kind of leave that along. So I don't want to lead anybody to say that, you know, I will take you on as an internship, but, you know, put it out there that I would like to see some of students from Cal State Dominguez take part in this internship program. Because number one, you know, you will learn about kind of what we do from a different perspective. Plus it's another tool in your toolbox. I mean, again, hashtag the hustle is real. The more information you have about programs, number one, it adds to that richness. And it may be a, a, a point where, well, you realize that this is not the type of mediation that I would like to do. Or you might say, hey, I'm all in. This is something that I, that I would like to do. So that's what's good about internships. You find out maybe what you want to do, maybe what you don't want to do, like one of the uh, uh, prior students talked about, you know, talked about going into school thinking one thing and coming out thinking something different. So um, internships uh, can take you uh, full circle sometimes. So that's pretty much my uh, part of the presentation. I'm going to unshare now and I'll leave my contact information and the, how do I unshare now? Just click on the top of your screen, Vincent. Okay, there we go. Perfect. I think I am back now. So um, this is our Q&A opportunity for students or faculty, or you have any questions for either Dr. Myers or for Vincent. This is your opportunity. Don't be shy. Well, I, I have a question, Vincent. 
and then I have one for Dr. Myers. So I, I can go first. So um, I know we talked briefly about you know, the internship and, and the career path opportunities. Can you talk a little bit more about that so the students have a little bit more information? So uh, basically uh, what our interns are doing now, it's a lot of it's research-based. So uh, we, again, going back to like the jurisdictional areas, I just could kind of give you like an example. Uh, let's just say there's a, uh, some conflict revolving around, uh, I'm trying not to be like too specific, um, about uh, I'll be a little, so there's an incident down in like San Diego County where there was some, uh, it was a basketball game and there, uh, it was different races playing against like a, another different race. And at the end of the game, there were some items thrown that were maybe typical of a certain uh, race, which was kind of very offensive. So again, it met our ju jurisdictional uh, boundaries. So we kind of go in and we start to do some uh, <coughs> uh, research gathering, reach out to different uh, parties, start to offer services and kind of see how we can build a, what we call a case from there. So what our interns are doing are assisting us with uh, uh, maybe contacts with different stakeholders or uh, uh, doing media searches because uh, cases come to us from a lot of different ways. Organizations call us because we've got a background are working with them, or we have to kind of go out there and kind of do a lot of uh, our research on our own, you know, uh, through uh, Google or different media sources, whichever way we can find that information and find out whether or not a particular incident fits a geographical area. So what our interns are doing now is like, say, research for us. They're going through like different, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Google or different um, internet sources to find out things that maybe. be uh, jurisdictional for us, for that conciliator to kind of pick up on, see whether or not they want to kind of um, do some outreach to, to start a case on it. So they're doing, again, a lot of uh, research base. So right now we're also in this phase where we're doing our strategic planning for, uh, for our next fiscal year. So they're helping us look at like where we want to go as from a regional perspective. What, if, what were our blind spots that we did not get to last fiscal year, but we mm -hmm. want to get to next fiscal year. So they're reaching out and seeing where maybe conflict areas are that have happened around, say like the West Coast or the Pacific Northwest, or the Rocky Mountain states, and come up with like um, <coughs> a list of things that have occurred for us to kind of add to this, um, this uh, strategic studies that we're doing right now. So the, most, of it, most of it's research-based, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Unfortunately, uh, just because we can't, because we're not employees, we can't have them doing part of the mediation, uh, mm -hmm. but they can sit in and listen to some of the mediations that we're doing with organizations. Um, like a lot of uh, listening sessions we're doing, again, API, uh, AAPI mm -hmm. kind of stuff. We've done a lot of those around the nation. Uh, so one of our interns has an opportunity to listen from stuff that has occurred from like White House level type stuff uh, to like regional stuff. So you get an opportunity to kind of hear other people's perspectives on say, say that kind of issue. So again, it's kind of research based right now. Okay. <coughs> Thank you for sharing that Vincent. Um, Dr. Myers, I have, well, it's not a question, it's more of, well, it is a question. So would you please elaborate a little bit about the different events um, that will be ongoing during the month of nonviolence? Absolutely. And I'd be glad to provide you with a calendar that you can share with the participants later if you wish. Um, you. We're going to start off. We actually started off with um, we have a group of faith leaders because we're trying to convince the faith leaders that they need to play a stronger role in educating people about violence reduction. Uh, interestingly, some time ago, just as a quick anecdote, I asked a faith leader some years ago to lead a, um, uh, in his sermon to talk about reducing violence. And he told me, I can't do that. 
A lot of the people in my congregation are either victims or perpetrators. I can't discuss that. Okay. So if the faith leaders are cowards, what do we go? Where do we go from there? So we had a prayer call last week with about 60 faith leaders urging them to use their churches as centers for peace building. Uh, we're going to have an event October 3rd, and people can go to the month of dot, monthofnonviolence.org website and see these events posted. But on October 3rd, we have a young man in Houston who has put together a panel to discuss how sports can be an alternative to violence. He has an NFL player, and he's going to be talking with agents and young people, recreational directors, about how sports can help young men use their energy. Because a lot of times this violence grows out of misplaced energy. They just don't know what to do with all of this energy. So they're gonna be telling them about how to channel that into a constructive way. Uh, we have a panel um, in October on the 13th on de-escalation. And that's gonna be very interesting. One of your colleagues is Dr. Joseph Bach who handles conflict resolution down at Kennesaw University will be on that panel. And they will be discussing uh, and Congresswoman Gwen Moore will also be on there. And so they'll be discussing the de-escalation bill and how people can promote the whole concept of de-escalation. So as the month goes, there are a series of activities. We have one on um, getting rid of the guns uh, and teen violence that the Pittsburgh chapter is leading. That's in October. All these events are in October. One on domestic violence. So what we do is we ask the local leaders to decide what is an issue in your community and ask them to create an event. One of the unexpected outcomes of COVID, of course, is now everything is national through Zoom. So we have people coordinating the event in one part of the country, but everyone can participate. We have a group of nurses in Phoenix, Arizona, who are going to talk about parenting. What is the role of parent leadership in stopping violence? And so that's going to be another theme. And then of course, October 29th and 30th will be the youth concert and the youth summit. And that's where we're asking young people, if anyone on this call knows a young person, we're kind of looking at the Gen Z's ages 14 to 24, who can dance, sing, poetry, as long as there is no violence or profanity, we would like very much to provide them with an opportunity to express themselves. We're, we're trying to help young people learn how to use music in a positive way. You know, a lot of this rap and hip hop can be very negative and very violent. And so we have to confront that and try to show them positives. So these are activities, the monthofnonviolence.org uh, on the internet can give you a, a more precise idea. You can sign up. And the last event I'll mention, which is the one that we're kind of excited about, I should say that Reverend Al Sharpton is one of our honorary co-chairs this year. And we also have uh, Dr. Ben Chavis, who's head of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. Dr. Martha Dawson, who's head of the Black Nurses. These are all national co-chairs. Rabbi uh, Jeffrey Myers from the Tree of Life Synagogue, where they had the terrible mass shooting in Pittsburgh two years ago. He's one of our good brothers, along with Imam Talib Sharif, who's a Muslim leader here in Washington. So those are our honorary co-chairs. And we're going to have an event October 16th, where we are honoring people who have demonstrated their commitment to social justice. And attorney Benjamin Crump is one of our honorees. And you all know what Benjamin Crump has done, especially in the George Floyd case and many others. We have an amazing man named Mickey Stevenson, who's from Los Angeles. Uh, he was one of the powers behind Motown. And so we're going to honor him because we know music can help change the culture. And Motown had beautiful music that, that really reinforced a lot of love and getting along. So those are just more uh, events that are going on during the month. If anyone is interested, please um, either put it in the chat or let um, Julie Ali or Renata know of your interest. We'd like to have you involved. And Black Women for Positive Change is a membership organization. Everyone's invited to be a part of it. And our mission is to change the culture of violence in America and the world. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Susan, you have a question? I did. I had a question for Dr. Myers, as a matter of fact. Hello, Dr. Myers, and thank you so much for, for you. your contribution to the tonight. 
Um, so I'm in particular studying conflict as it relates to um, um, churches, black churches, and uh, the effects of systemic oppression on our community and how that translates um, into the church community. And one of the issues that I'm finding in my research is that which we all know, there's a diminished interest in of young people in organized um, religion um, and in the church. When we went through the civil rights movement, it was kind of church, you know, um, influenced. And I'd like you to speak to the current um, at, uh, atmosphere with young people in relationship to the church. And if you see any way moving forward that it could be effective? Well, that's a really great question. Yes, our young people are definitely kind of moving away from the tradition of the church. And a lot of our faith leaders, and we've worked closely with faith leaders, they, um, they really talk to each other. A lot of the adult faith leaders spend the majority of their time with people around their own age. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned that I just don't see them reaching out the way that I would like to see them reaching out. Sure, they have youth programs at the church and they have Bible study and they have the various organized outlets. But in terms of direct involvement, I think the faith leaders really need to take a close look at what they're doing to work with the young people because I'm just not seeing it. Uh, we have a strong emphasis in the community on our traditional faith leaders and they've been terrific leaders and they still are, but we have to stop talking to each other. Like the young man told me, you all talk to each other. You're obsessed with your lives and you're not giving us enough to dream about. We have to break out of that circle where adults are so obsessed with their own jobs, with their relationships, with their, 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 their responsibilities. They don't have a lot of time for the young folks. It's just, it's just not there. So we have to find some new ways to create relationships. Now we created something we call the Gen Z connection in our group. And that's been a lot of fun. And these have been young folks where we have tried to expose them to interesting people that they wouldn't ordinarily meet. So we set up coffee chats on Saturday morning via Zoom. And we let the young people meet a, a few really successful businessmen, people that have built million dollar companies. Well, these young folks hadn't taught, had a chance to ask questions to anybody like that. So, and our young folks are incredibly smart. They're not going for the, the same old okie doke. So if you want to get their attention, you really need to try to find people who are unique, that can capture their attention, who know more than they know, and, and try to bring them in touch. Uh, because they're, they're really into a lot in technology, of course, they have to be technology savvy. So part of part of what I'm 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 pointing to is the lack of um, training in Bible colleges and seminaries as they relate to conflict resolution and those things. And I'm seeing a resistance for, from what you're saying, the older guard that talk to each other and don't really deal with those issues because they take a, a biblical stance. You know, if you're a good Christian, you're not gonna be in conflict. Exactly. And, exactly. and so, I, you know, looking forward, coming out of this pandemic with all the division and everything, I think the suggestion about the coffee thing on Saturdays is a good one, but do you think it's gonna be possible to um, have a paradigm shift so that young people again become interested because apparently they're spiritual, but they're just not religious. Well, I think that if your research, if you publish it, ask the hard questions, put the hard answers out there, I think we have to challenge the um, mainstream establishment of the faith leaders and push them to change. And I think if they do, Look at, the, look at the facilities that our churches have. Yes. You know, we, we talked about creating a peace bench. Black Women for Positive Change wanted to get the faith leaders to create a peace bench 
So anyone who was going through conflict in the congregation could go sit on that bench. Maybe it's outside, maybe it's inside, but everyone would know just by the fact that they were sitting there, that they were in crisis. And they could come over to that individual, talk with them, hug them, counsel them. So far, we haven't gotten far with that idea because the church is saying, we don't wanna attract trouble into the church because you know people are shooting up funerals. So, yes. you know, I mean, I've got to give some sympathy to the faith leaders. They don't want to invite the gang to come into the church and shoot up the place. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. So we do have to find some innovative approaches to bringing young people in in a safe way mm -hmm. and addressing their concerns. And I hope you, I really look forward to hearing about your research because someone needs to get out there and say some pretty tough stuff. Well, I, you know, I, I would look forward to having more conversation with you on the subject, um, if you don't mind. And um, it is very exciting. Absolutely. And I'd be glad to introduce you to our Faith Leaders Committee. You might want to have a focus group with them or some kind of discussion. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me your name, please. Susan Grayson. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions for either Vincent or Dr. Myers? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Professor Valerie? Yes. Can, can I just say, um, I, a few people asked about it, other information about peace and education and the summit. Um, I don't know if everyone's watching the chat, but I did share the information in the chat a couple of times so and anyone can reach out to me if they have any questions I could probably point you in the right direction and who to talk to if I'm not sure of the answer to your question so okay thank you do you have a question for uh, uh Vincent Player if, if, uh, if I can Certainly. um Certainly. you know number of uh <clears throat> our courses are are uh focused around case studies and uh, much of your work and your program I think would be uh, really beneficial, but I understand sometimes um, the need for confidentiality around some of the issues that you deal with, but is there an opportunity or way to get uh, some of the matters that you've had to deal with in the past and that we could use in, in the course of our um, program as well? That is an excellent question. It really is. We put out every year and it's on our website. Uh, it's a, uh, our, our annual report and it has uh, kind of uh, watered down case studies like success stories basically that uh, tell the story but they're not specific so um, again I've only been here eight months I think that's a question that could and should be had in the interest of academia with uh, like our administration uh, about that because you know what we do could or should uh, and will add value to what you know schools around the nation are doing as far as like peace resolution. Uh, again, I'm, we're, we're, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Mr. But you know we kind of live in this this confidential mode for some of the reasons that I that I talked about. But you know, there's no progress without pushing, right? Um. I'd like to follow up on what uh, Professor Castro said, Dr. Castro. Uh, if there's a way that you can uh, provide us with like a redacted um, case, you know, we leave names out and stuff like that, that could be enormously helpful to us with students mm -hmm. uh, as we give that to them to uh, do role uh, role playing and, and stuff. So, and, and uh, you know, it's uh, real life. It gives them an idea of some of the things that come up in in, in the real world. And I think if, if and we'd be willing to work with you on that uh, <clears throat> because I think it would add enormous value. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that that uh, that report we put out has those redacted stories on there. And when we go through this, uh, this program with uh, the school in October, as part of that training program, uh, they'll be working on like 
you know, scenarios. It's kind of scenario based. It's not just, you know, talking head kind of thing. So they've got an opportunity to uh, go over like case studies and go over like meeting design based on like scenarios. So I think that will add a lot of value. Well, anything, anything we can do to assist in that regard, we'd be happy to, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vincent, thank you, Professor Rhodes. Thank you so much. And Dr. Castro for those good questions. I do think definitely, you know, it's good for role plays. It's good for, you know, just kind of working with the students to, to as they write their conflict analysis, they think through. Um, I think that'll be, you know, tremendous value. Um, but I'd like to ask Vincent if you could talk a little bit about some of the free webinars because I just went to, I attended two webinars over the last two weeks, I think. So I'm trying to think of the, uh, it escapes me, but um, DOJ has, uh, they, they host these webinars. It's through, a, 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 I don't say a company they use. And the name escapes me, and I can provide that later. But they have a lot of different webinars that deal. There's some do with like conflict resolution, some with do with like policing, some deal with leadership. I just, I just, you know, went out on my own. Actually, bought a like an advanced subscription because they're just so impactful. Uh, but I'll, again, I, I forget the name of the the group that that actually hosts them. Uh, but I can provide that so you can get out to your students. But they're just very, very uh, impactful for like like learning. And they're not really long seminars. Uh, one that I went to recently uh, is about quantitative methods uh, for like engagement, for like police engagement. You know, how do they quantify whether or not what they're doing in communities is, is, is working, which I thought was like phenomenal. How do you quantify the fact that you have a program or how do you quantify your engagement with like communities? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um Okay, we have a question from Dr. Kreiser. Yes. Oh, no, I was just raising oh. my thumbs up because oh. quantifying things is a great thing. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Um, do we have well, any other? Area. That's Dr. Kreiser's area, and certainly that's a good connection, actually, yeah. uh, for uh, Vince to connect with on that with you in particular because of all that work you're doing. Yeah, yeah, great, good connection. Sorry, sorry Renee. No, no, no. no. I, I was just reading the chat, something that Rachel had put in the chat. Um, yes, well, so, what, I saw that chat, but then it went off. What did she say? She the program said, was um, Rachel said that uh, the California State University has a grant from Super Sunday Relationships between campuses and local faith-based organizations. We were awarded one at SSU. Do you think the Black Women for Positive Change has an offering to easily integrate into our relationship endeavors? Hmm. So, Rachel. Yes. Yes. So, SSU, acronym. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, Sonoma State University. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, Sonoma State. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, I would have to, to think about that in terms of a good answer. Uh, at this stage, we have a couple of films that we've produced that perhaps you might be able to use in your program. They're anti-violence films. They, they don't feature faith leaders, however, but they do chronicle real stories. They're on our website, Black Women for Positive Change, um, two anti-violence films that perhaps you're we would, uh, churches have played these films in the past and then have okay. a discussion with the young people afterwards. Okay. So that be something you can use. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. And they're just, they're just available on your website? They are, uh-huh. One is called On Second Thought. Uh, it's a movie, we raised the money, wrote the script and all that. It was a love triangle that re acted in, uh, resulted in disaster and then we go back and ask the young people, what would happen if you had a second thought? And then we produce a different outcome. So those are questions that faith leaders could be and should be asking young people. You know, what happens if you approach situations differently instead of anger and violence? You know, you do something, reach out to a mentor and get mm -hmm. some help. So um, 
So no, those are, and then the peace bench that I mentioned was a, is an idea that we've also wanted to promote and would love to work in partnership with faith institutions to, uh, to do demo, to do a demo on peace benches and see if they work. If um, people are willing to go sit there and let people know they're in trouble and then are people willing then to go com and comfort them? So that that's sounds great. Yeah, the, the, right, our yeah. main partnership is with a, um, a faith-based organization who actually is building a new place. So maybe that would be a, an interesting thing because they could build a bench while they're building it. Um, and they have a youth ministry. So they're, they're, uh, they are not solely focused, but they're very much focused on their youth. So um, good. Yeah. So I'll look at your website. Thank you for this information. Sure. And one other quick response. We, we started something called a Harmony Jam, and you can go on YouTube to Black Women for Positive Change Urgent Issues channel, and you'll see the Harmony Jam, where we invited the kids to put on a concert. And that worked out well. We have the young people, we had their parents came to hear them perform, and we challenged them to write nonviolence, uh, music, poetry, they could do hip hop and rap, but no profanity. And uh, we had some real discussions with the kids because some of them like to use profanity and we told them no. And if you're able to put something like that on with some prize money, then that's really uh, another approach also. So music really <laughs> attracts them. Yeah. Give them a challenge. Tell them they have to do it in a way that's positive. Mm -hmm. and they'll fuss for a while, but then they'll do it. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Thank you. And just quickly, one of the things with the upcoming youth summit and the concert, those are the very, con you know, conditions and the criteria that we've established for our youth performers. But what's amazing is that there is so much that Black Women for Positive Change that they've brought to the table. There's a producer. And so, you know, things that we need to be saying, you know, speaking that same language to the youth. So it's not like we're way over here and they're way over there. We're, you know, we need to connect with them. And so music is a way of connecting. And I think if all of y'all could, you know, if you know any youth, promote the fact that, you know, it's not just a concert. These are professional, these are music industry leaders that will be, you know, determining, you know, gosh, does this you know, person have talent? What is their talent? Okay, let's give them an audition. Let's bring them on and, and have them perform. And it's just, it's a morale booster for the youth. It's something that says, this is me. I'm sharing to the world. This is the best of me. And so if we can give them, you know, this venue and then the opportunity to talk about because they told us what they want to talk about. They want to talk about entrepreneurship. It's like, oh no, you guys have ruined it. And there's not gonna be any government jobs left for us. So <laughs> we've got to figure out how to make our own money. Mm -hmm. But then once we make our money, we've got to figure out how to spend it and what's credit and how do we save? Because they're not getting those lessons in school. So they're looking for community-based resources and organizations to help fill in those gaps. They also wanted to talk about social activism. What does that look like? How do they get connected? As Dr. Meyer said earlier, they are not going for the okie doke. Like my kids said, I'm not doing no kumbaya. We, we're going out, we're gonna make a change. That kumbaya stuff is, is over. So if you know of anyone, any organization that maybe Julie and I can reach out to um, please let us know. We've put together a wonderful program, Dr. Myers and all of her, her, her team. I mean, just her connections across all of the U.S. They've been great. Um, it's going to be a wonderful event, an absolutely wonderful event, but we need your help in bringing in that audience. And I'm just surprised that we don't have, I think when I looked at the numbers the day before yesterday, we only had eight, eight people signed up. Yeah, that's the challenge. And um, Renata will have to also make the tape. And we've got this guy, Mickey Stevenson with Motown to play the kids music to. So we can there again, tie them in with someone. And if any of you have heard of a man named Dietrich Haddon, he's gonna be performing as well. And he's got a song called, I Can't Breathe. 
So connecting the kids with people who are successful is really important. Another model program we've used for those of you who are looking for ideas are essay contests. That's easy. You can do it with the high school or the middle school, raise some money and give the kids a challenge, something to write about. How do you reduce violence at your school? We've done that in several cities now, the District of Columbia and Pittsburgh. The kids will respond to essay contests if the teacher gives it to them as a challenge and if there's a hundred dollar reward at the end of it. And they write some powerful stories. Yes. Very good. I, I, I see that we're coming a little bit up to time and mm -hmm. wanted to keep us a little bit on track. So I know people are trying to get up. There's, there's also people concerned about the earthquake, earthquake. and yes. safety as well. So um, I want to, if we could, can, are we done, Renata, with questions? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, I just, I just wanted to, to take the time to thank everybody here tonight that came. I really appreciate your support, ongoing support of the program, friends, community, colleagues, faculty, students, and our, particularly our guests, our speakers tonight. And uh, we're very grateful that you've taken the time to spend it with us on a Friday night and uh, to, to tell us these, what your jobs are about, what you do, the information and the connections, the ongoing connections, and the emphasis on mentorship and practice. So with that, let's call it a, a night, well, adjournment. I'll give you some time to get out and have dinner, a cup of tea, coffee, and, or a glass of wine and relax a little bit. And um, take it easy and, and uh, take care of yourselves, all right? All the best to everybody, particularly in the earthquake zone right now. All right, ciao, Thank folks. You. Take care, Bye, everyone. Take Thank you, everyone.